now we're recording. There we go. Okay. We've, uh, for the recording, we've just introduced myself, David Ensign, George Boone, Peter Vitali, and Sarah Silver. Uh, Lupita. Hello. Lupita Montoya. Uh, we've got John Gerstel. Hello. Uh, and I know that we're waiting for Lisa Smith, who I have actually- She just got here. Oh, she just got here. So Lisa, if uh, once you enable your uh, video, you can just say a quick hello. We're introducing since we have new members of our boards. Hello, sorry, having a little technical issues. Um, I'm Lisa Smith. Great. Uh, are we saying more than that? <laughs> That's all we're saying. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> just want to get to the agenda. So um, I'll pass it over to Tila, who's uh, uh, chair of the uh, Transportation Advisory Board to introduce your board to us. Hey, David. Uh, this is our first joint meeting that I know of, you know, in my in my time on the board, so it's really lovely to see you all. Uh, we are joined this evening uh, with Mark McIntyre. Hello. Yeah, hello, there you are, Alex Weinheimer. Hey, everyone. Hi, uh, I think Hutch just joined and is maybe still connecting, so I'll give him a it, it won't let me, uh, it won't let my video work. It says oh, the host we'll let your video permit work. it. Well, Hutch is uh, like Batman there. In the dark and unknown, unknowable, but we'll meet soon. And our newest member, Ryan Chuhart. Oh. Hi. Until we, I don't, I don't see you either. I don't know if anyone else sees you. Oh. Yeah, your video isn't on, but uh, we can see your box when you speak. Well, you're here. If, you, if you'd like to leave and rejoin, we're about to just go through the, the rules and regulations. You might want to just try try again, but uh, otherwise, you're here. <laughs> yeah, we. Oh, there, there you are. There you are, Rob. All right. Well, thank you, Tila and Tab, for those introductions. We're looking forward to this. And I'll just go ahead and hand it back over to you, Gene. And it sounds like. Um, Gene's going to pretty much run us through. Um, the ch us chairs will do our best to help out when necessary, but I think Gene has a real handle on, on the one agenda item today, which is to uh, do a work session on the East Boulder subcommunity plan, uh, provide feedback. I know Jean Gene is going to give us a couple of very specific uh, questions that they would like answers to, and we're probably going to be asked to keep our comments pretty brief during that period and then open up for more uh, discussion after that. So with uh, that's all after the uh, uh, public comment and presentation. So, Jean, go ahead uh, with the rules of participation. Thank you, David. Um, I'm going to keep my video off for a little bit. Um, I've got it seems to be freezing up a little bit. So hopefully that will work itself out. Can you all see my screen? Yes. OK, as David said, welcome to the Joint Planning Board and City Council, or uh, I'm sorry, Joint Planning Board and Transportation Advisory Board meeting. Um, we have um, a lot to cover tonight. We are so excited to share information with you and to get your feedback. Um, but with that, I'm just going to go over a quick couple of um, points for the protocol for our meeting. Um, and so quickly, any activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise inf interfere with the meeting are prohibited. We'll have a very brief um, open comment at the beginning. Since this isn't really a public hearing, it's really it's just a working session. Um, if you would like to address the board, please have your full name displayed. And um, we'll use the raise hand function in just a minute to um, indicate if you would like to speak to the board. Um, folks will have three minutes each. Let's see. There we go. Um, our board members and staff will participate with video, um, but uh, members of the public will not have uh, be asked to not have your video on and uh, participate by voice only during the open comment. Um, I will I will um, call on folks during that open comment. Let us not use the chat function for any kind of um, comment or questions. That's really for only um, technical issues. We'd like to keep the conversation in the um, as a conversation within the room, as we say, um, for here. And that's really for the board members tonight. Okay, I think that's it for 
the intro rules. Um, and as David said, um, our agenda tonight, uh, we'll just go through the quick open comment and then um, Jacob and Erica will uh, kick off this item. Kathleen and Jean Sanson have a brief presentation. And then we have, um, and then we'll, we'll go into the discussion topics. At that point, I'll, I'll do some um, calling on folks in, in reverse alpha and alpha order to try to really move through to make sure that we hear from each one of you. But I'll explain that when we get a little closer. Okay, um, I think at this point, let's open the public comment. I see that we have at least one hand raised. Uh, Michael Kaplan, you have your hand up. Michael, um, so I, um, David, do you have to officially, I guess it's not really a public hearing, it's just open comment, so I can open that. Um, Michael and then Lynn Siegel. So Michael, you can unmute and I will start your three minutes. You can go ahead. Thanks, Jean. Good to see you, by the way. Oh, it's good to see Sorry you. To see you. Uh, so a, a very quick background. Uh, myself and family have lived in Boulder since 1980. Uh, I was actually one of the members of the first ad hoc transportation committee that created the first master transportation plan and was on the first transportation plan. Uh, transportation board. I wanted to just talk for a few minutes about some things that relate both to the East Boulder plan and several other plans as it relates primarily to transportation issues on Arapaho. We live uh, off of MacArthur, which is uh, just about a block uh, east of Foothills. Uh, as of this time, it is almost impossible for us to make a left-hand turn going west on Arapaho. If we go right and go up to the hospital light, sometimes the traffic is backed up already into the through lane on the left side. So either way, it's a challenge today to make a safe, safe way onto the west side, going west. Uh, I have seen little of anything on three projects that are in the midst at the moment. One being what might happen through the working group plan on East Boulder uh, at uh, 55th and Arapaho. Secondly, the Waterview project and thirdly, Ball. And unless we look at all of those at the same time as they relate to traffic on a holistic basis, rather than what seems to be being done now as they're looked at individually without taking in the already challenging problems on Arapaho and talk also about the fact that on the north side of Arapaho, there are additional projects that are possibly in the works. Uh, we're facing some major problems as to it relates to traffic on that street and will make it almost impossible for people like myself to get, uh, get across that street, either by walking or by driving. It'll mean us going around through the neighborhood and coming out on another part. One last comment as it relates to the East Boulder plan. I have some concerns when we have contradictory uh, programs or principles and the one that I'm talking about now is it relates to creating walkable communities. And so I am concerned about us creating a lot more residents in an industrial commercial area where there's no walkable resources at the moment, but we're talking about creating those rather than looking to places that may have more NIMBY problems, such as shopping centers, but maybe much better places for us to be considering what we want to do for housing in particular and affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome, Jean. Okay, Lynn, you're up. Lynn, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. 
Well, this illustrates exactly uh, what we need to do is have more contiguous neighborhoods and they can't be positioned really on these arterials like Waterview off of Arapaho, like a cul-de-sac micro city, as I've described, anchored with a tavern. Like, what's this about? And, um, and Canyon, the issue, I'm so glad that you're meeting the TAB and the planning board. And what you need to do now is have a meeting with, and the task will be CU South, but other things, because everything's about CU South, basically. And that is grab OSBT, TAB, and planning board. And guess what? You don't have to have a big room because it's all on Zoom. You know, you don't have to have, you know, the council chambers jammed up with four different boards because it'll all be on the same thing. This is what Boulder needs is the integrative approach, you know, and the intersectionality of all these groups and all working off in different directions, like your hands and your fingers all going off and working independently. They need to be so integrated or, um, with this very sensitive community to be balanced perfectly. And, you know, the traffic implications of CU South are for all of Boulder. You know, the thought of even placing CU South up in North Boulder is stunning. You know, do you remember the North Boulder subcommunity? Safeway of the whole community for the biggest Safeway in Colorado up at North Boulder. Do you know how that would have changed the footprint of that neighborhood? Like unbelievably. Luckily, last minute, you know what happened? Ask Harry Charlie. Uh, last minute, there was some deal cut. I don't know if anyone here remembers, maybe John, um, with planning board about Kmart. And it just happened that the Safeway could end up at Kmart and not in that community up there. Um, so integrated. And it really needs to be integrated on the climate integrative master plan combined with the Boulder Valley master plan, the BVCP and the climate um, master plan because the job housing balance with the Boulder Valley comp plan is not being enforced and it needs to be enforceable with this dual partnership of these two master plans together. So listen up, uh, Jacob, you're on the line. And, and that's really what needs to happen here. Um, and, and everything needs to be quantified. You know, how, how many different job types and income types in each development? And then you just figure it all out the job types and 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 the um and the housing types because you need about you know different income levels of housing types and put po get a point system for all of them and then this is how many points you get for this development and you can vary it somewhat but you have to have a certain minimal amount of points for each you know for housing and for the types of jobs the types of jobs so, because <laughs> Those houses are each going to produce service jobs. And so it has to be also um, compounded, like compounded interest. So it's a little bit complex. Thanks, Lynn. If you could wrap up, please. Pardon? Please wrap up. Yeah. So, so it's not, it's complex, but it's not undoable. And, and if, you know, you people are all experts in all of this, you can figure out how to characterize all of it and put it together. And then you, your meetings won't be so long and it'll be much more simple in how the developer characterizes their development. And they'll have choices. It's like a little kid, you give them choices. So thanks, thanks so much. Okay. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Sure. Um, anybody else? Um, okay, it looks like Henry Graf, you have your hand up. Oh um, yeah, it's Georgie. Welcome Georgie and um, welcome. Great. Henry, you can go ahead. Hello, I'm Henry Graff. I live in the El Dorado Springs area, and I read your uh, plan for the East Boulder subcommunity, and I was actually quite pleased. Um, I think that Boulder has a huge housing shortage. Obviously, you cannot serve every resident with market rate uh, housing, but 
I think that you can alleviate a lot of the supply problem with market rate housing. And I'm really pleased to see that um, we're focusing on, uh, you know, growing uh, jobs for our middle and working class in Boulder. And we're uh, building up on already settled land, which means that, you know, there's a lot less open space claimed by new suburbs. Um, one thing I was thinking about reading your plan is I was hoping um, that some of these developments could actually be bigger. I think that it's good to uh, actually reach the Boulder height limit where feasible. I also think um, that a plan that, uh, you know, adds more jobs than it does houses is possibly going to be problematic in the future. Um, you know, obviously we all know the horror story of the Bay Area where they added eight jobs for every new house. Um, and we should, you know, I think target 1.5 jobs for every house. And um, since I think, you know, good paying jobs for our citizens are a great thing, I think we should really focus on broad upzoning in the city. I think that El Dorado Springs, for example, um, you know, obviously outside of Boulder City, but it would be great if lot divisions and duplexes were easier here. I lived in Table Mesa um, during my early childhood. And I think that a denser zone around uh, the, the shopping area in Table Mesa would be a really great idea. It has great access to public transit corridors. Um, I think it would really, you know, improve the income diversity of that neighborhood. Um, as uh, Lynn and Michael have talked about, I think Lynn's idea of a point system is actually actually a really interesting one. Um, but I just want to say, I think that this plan is great and I want to see more plans like it. I want to see us becoming um, less of a town and more of a city so that we can really build an inclusive um, income diverse city. I'm not planning on being a banker or a tech worker um, when I get out of college. <laughs> and I would love it to, I would love to be able to live in a tall apartment in Boulder, Colorado and be a journalist or an artist. Um, that sounds absolutely wonderful. So keep up the great work. Thanks, Henry. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, seeing no one else for open comment, we'll close that and um, get to the heart of our discussion tonight. Um, I will turn it over to Jacob and Erica to kick things off. Thank you, Jean, um, and thank you uh, everyone for being here. Um, I'll keep my remarks brief. Um, I'm Jacob Lindsay, uh, the Director of Planning and Development Services. So when creating uh, sub-community plans for the city, it only makes sense to consider land use and transportation together. That, uh, in short, is what great cities do. And that's one of the reasons I'm so happy to see this collaboration today. I don't know when the last time Planning Board and TAB met together, but I can imagine it wasn't recently. And to the members of the Transportation Advisory Board, your role and monitoring and proposing changes to the transportation master plan is so important. And to see you meeting collectively with the planning board in your role and advise in, in regards to advising with plans and land uses of the city is really an incredible occasion. So thank you all for being here. Um, and I know that as you discuss this plan today, the East Boulder Subcommunity Plan. I'm sure that you all in your respective roles are coming together to consider the broadest common good that we can create together for the city of Boulder. So uh, with that, I know that we have a lot more um, to come and I'm sure that you're all uh, eager to get into the real discussion of this meeting. So I'll turn it over to our Director of Transportation and Mobility, Erica Vandenbrand. Hello, I'm Erica Vandenbrand, as Jacob said, I'm the Director of Transportation and Mobility here in Boulder. 
Um, I will be ultra brief. I just wanted to welcome all of you um, together. And it's so nice to be able to see both um, the Transportation Advisory Board and the Planning Board together. And um, I know that none of you are shrinking violets um, in terms of your opinions. And I really look forward to hearing um, all the wisdom that comes from tonight. And just wanted to again, say thank you for your service to the community and thank you for your consideration in helping make Boulder a really great place, particularly for the sub-community plan. So thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. I turned over hosting to Holly and uh, couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> All right. Um, well, at this point, we have a great presentation um, and a lot of really good information for you. So um, Kathleen, Jean, you want to kick that off? Sounds good. Hello, everyone. I'm going to um, share my screen and we will get going. going to just switch this over. Here we go. Are you seeing just the slides? Okay, great. Um, so uh, good evening. It's, it's nice to see everyone tonight. My name is Kathleen King and I'm a senior planner in comprehensive planning. I'm joined by my colleagues, Jean Gatza, also in comp planning and communications. Um, she's been heavily involved in the engagement for this project and um, is going to help facilitate tonight's meeting. And then as well as Jean Sanson from Transportation, who um, has been working through the subcommunities transportation network and has also been directing a lot of the work around the 55th and Arapaho station area master plan, which we'll touch on um, tonight as well. So thanks for coming together for this joint session. Um, we've reached a key milestone in the East Boulder subcommunity plan process and thought this would be a great time to bring the two boards together, discuss the community feedback we've heard to date, and then um, hopefully you know, work together as a team tonight to outline the direction forward for the East Boulder area. Um, a couple of folks mentioned this, but uh, we're gonna start tonight with a presentation just to get everyone on the same page. I'll give you some background on the project and talk about um, where we're at today. Um, you know, I usually uh, don't like to speak for too long, but we have a, a lot of information to share. So um, hang in with, hang with me for the presentation. Um, we wanna make sure everyone has enough information to weigh in on our key questions. And then we're gonna work through some of those questions with the whole group. Your feedback will help us narrow in on some characteristics for uh, areas of change in East Boulder. Um, we're going to be using a tool called Mural to workshop some ideas and take a look at some maps and images in an attempt to replicate what we might do if we were able to hold this work session in person. So this is a format we've been using with our working group and, and during some community focus groups to document feedback. Um, and it's been working pretty well. So um, we're going to give it a give it a whirl tonight as well. Um, we have a larger group tonight, but our hope is um, to hear from everyone and be able to walk away from the session with some clear direction that we can share um, at City Council next week. We're going to um, um, go to a study session. So as we're walking through the presentation, um, here are the key issues that we want you to kind of keep in mind and think about for discussion. Does the land use plan balance what we're hearing from the community with citywide goals that we have described in the Boulder Valley Comp Plan? And as we think about the evolution of this place over the next 20 years, what transportation considerations do we need to consider that can best support evolving land uses in this part of town? So as a reminder, and maybe an introduction for our newer board members, the purpose of subcommunity planning is to really take the big citywide goals um, that are outlined in our, in our comprehensive plan and consider where and how these can be implemented in a subcommunity at the local level. There's two key deliverables of a subcommunity plan. So first is a land use plan. And so that updates the city's land use map and guides decision-making about land management, uh, capital improvements and development review. 
And then the second is a connections plan. This updates the city's transportation master plan and similarly guides decisions about management and investment in our transportation network. So we've gotten a lot of questions from the public about the power of these plans and how they get realized. So um, Erica put together these slides to help us illustrate how plans affect the built environment. Subcommunity plans have a lot of opportunity for community input to guide the future. And then once adopted, those plans are translated into zoning code and updates to the design and construction standards, which provide the framework for future development projects. Transportation planning considers a network of opportunities and the public gets to have a lot of input into how we invest our, in our system and what the outcomes should be. Then that plan gets implemented over time by coordinating with other, other local providers, developers, as well as taking on capital improvements ourselves to construct or improve projects. So I know um, we have some new folks who recently joined the board. So just to orient everyone to the East Boulder subcommunity, we're looking at the area generally north of Arapahoe Avenue and east of Foothills Parkway. The subcommunity includes some major landmarks like the Boulder Community Health Foothills Campus, uh, the Municipal Airport, Belmont City Park, and Flatiron Business Park. The area is about 1,600 acres and includes around 700 parcels. There's a very small residential community at San Lazaro Mobile Home Park, and the subcommunity supports about 17,000 jobs. Um, and there was a, a typo in your packet that said 1,700 jobs, but it, it's much more at 17,000. So apologies about that typo. Um, for some context, this is about 10% of the city's land area. It's less than 1% of the population and then makes up about 16% of um, jobs in the city. So first, uh, you know, the big challenge, what are we doing here? As I mentioned earlier, the purpose of subcommunity planning is to implement our citywide goals at a local level, and our goals are not small. The city wants to increase the amount of affordable housing options in Boulder. We're hoping to reduce single occupant vehicle trips and create 15 minute neighborhoods. The city wants to establish resiliency in the face of climate change, protect our small and local businesses, and foster places and networks for the creation of art and celebration of local cultures. It's a lot, it's, it's a lot of big goals and um, they're challenging to achieve. So we've been working with community members over the last few months to ask about priorities. How do we balance these goals in East Boulder? Which of these goals should be prioritized for this part of town? And how much potential change can we accommodate without negatively impacting the other goals? One of the most impactful tools we have to implement some of those citywide goals is land use planning. So um, this is the land use plan for East Boulder as described in the BVCP. And a main goal of this process is to consider whether these planned uses will provide the types of opportunity and changes that the community wants to see take place in this area over the next 20 years, or whether we should make some changes to this plan to better align, those to better align it with those community desires. So over the past year, the East Boulder Working Group has been meeting on Zoom to consider what an alternative future for East Boulder might look like and what kinds of land use changes would support citywide goals and visions for the subcommunity. As a reminder, um, the subcommunity planning process is committed to operating in the collaborate space of our um, engagement framework. So this is considered the highest level of engagement and um, this working group takes on a lot of responsibility for tackling the challenges of the project. And then um, just to mention, John Gerstle serves as our planning board liaison. And so he's attended all of our um, meetings and, and has um, been a great contributor to that group. So um, as I mentioned, this is the land use plan that we're considering updating. This currently envisions that over half the area will be um, industrial land uses. There's a significant amount of designated open space and parks land, and then some that is categorized as public. Um, so that includes places like the airport and the, the hospital campus. And then there's just a few uh, community business parcels at 55th and Arapahoe. So what we've seen um, happen under this plan over the last 10 years is that the area has been transitioning from an industrial area to more uh, flex and office space. So with the exception of the hospital and um, 
some of the newer medical uses near that campus. This place or this change has taken place primarily through um, property renovations and improvements rather than redevelopment. We've also found that some of the more traditional industrial tenants in the area have migrated to newer buildings in other locations or other cities. And that office and flex tenants like research or tech companies um, have moved in and repurposed some of those industrial spaces. I think it's also um, noteworthy that there's, there's a perception that this area offers um, more affordable employment space within the city. And that's true in some um, specific sites, but in general, um, office rents here are generally lower than citywide averages, but some of the industrial flex space is actually a little higher than other places in the city like, um, like Gun Barrel. Um, and that's, you know, kind of despite the fact that much of that industrial flex space in East Boulder is, is pretty dated. So I think um, some of these trends are, are part of the reason that council selected East Boulder for subcommunity planning in 2019. There's an understanding that change is happening in the area and we wanna find ways to manage that change that will benefit our citywide goals and the community. So um, we last met with both of these boards uh, this past fall to look at some potential changes and talk about modeling, um, projections, and scenario testing. We tested three alternative future land use scenarios and a no change scenario to provide some metrics for community members to consider. We put all of that information out there and asked the community to weigh in. So because um, we're still operating solely online, our engagement methods took a different form this winter than I think what we're used to doing. Um, but I'll say, I think that the program we provided, although new to the community and the staff, um, it was still pretty effective. Over 500 people participated in the engagement process over the past two and a half months and um, engagement is still ongoing. Over 300 people completed our online questionnaire through Be Her Boulder, um, many of whom took a lot of time and care to submit some really uh, thoughtful comments. As part of the project, we created um, informational videos in both English and Spanish to describe the project and the land use options. And some of those videos had almost 200 views. We also hosted four live events to get face-to-face -face time with community members. Um, three of those were held in English and then one was in Spanish. So I hope you got a chance to review um, the engagement summary included in the packet, but if not, you know, please check out the project webpage. You can review all the community comments we've received to date. Um, there's a lot and people gave really an enormous amount of time and thought into their participation in, in the project. So it's definitely worth reviewing. Um, I'm gonna focus on a couple areas of feedback that I think will be really important for our conversation tonight. So the first area um, I'll talk about is housing. Um, you know, some of the big questions for this plan have been, do we want housing in East Boulder? If we do, how much of it and where should it go? Um, and what we've heard is, you know, yes, most people support developing new housing in East Boulder, especially if we can find a way to provide affordable and attainable housing aimed at people who work in the area. So in general, I think we've got a lot of um, feedback about commuters coming to East Boulder for work and community members are interested in providing housing as a way of reducing commutes traffic and thereby um, reducing some of the emissions generated by those trips. We also heard that people wanna see housing in um, mixed in with other uses. So the idea of 15 minute neighborhoods in East Boulder is widely supported. There was really um, very little interest in dedicating an area to residential only uses. People want to provide a mix, I think because um, you know, it's a, it's a convenient way to live, but also again, because of the opportunity um, that type of mix prov provides to um, reduce car trips. There was also some great input and feedback about the San Lazaro Mobile Home Park. Um, so this is the only residential community that is within the boundary of the East Boulder subcommunity. It is, however, outside the city limits and located in Boulder County. The area is eligible for annexation, but is privately owned. 
Um, there's a lot of support for quality of life for these residents by working to protect the park for mobile homes, keep their rents relatively low, and getting residents access to city services and programs. Right now, we're um, limited in what we can offer for residents here since they are outside the city. But residents of this area have been really willing to participate throughout this process. And staff is looking for ways to create a win-win situation um, for the property owner and the residents. Another idea that garnered a lot of support was co-locating new housing with um, area green space. Valmont City Park is the city's largest active recreation park and is located in this area. And then we also have access out here to Boulder Creek, um, the Boulder Creek Path, as well as South Boulder Creek. So kind of on the, the flip side of our houses, houses to job scale um, is the idea of East Boulder as a place to do business as a, as a job center. And um, what we learned in this last engagement window is community members really value East Boulder business space. And it came through loud and clear that it is important to preserve and prioritize this kind of space for a variety of types and sizes of businesses. Related to that variety, um, many community members would like to see new retail in the area, especially related to food and beverage, um, places like markets, restaurants, bars were frequently cited. We also heard through some focus groups about interest in expanding medical uses in East Boulder. Um, there's major demand for medical and medical office space in the area because of the close proximity to services at the hospital. Um, and so that topic came up with some frequency as well. There's also a lot of concern in the community about how changes in the area could impact East Boulder businesses. So people wanna make sure that East Boulder isn't just a place for startups. We wanna allow businesses to evolve and grow in Boulder after they experience, they, after they experience success. There is some worry that introducing new housing to the area will create real conflicts with the realities of industrial and manufacturing businesses like noises, truck traffic and security. So it's important to community members that real thought goes into siting any new housing into strategic locations. And then there's also, um, I think a lot of just worry about how future changes, um, redevelopment or investment will impact the affordability of some industrial spaces and the rents in the area. So the idea of gentrification in East Boulder and losing some of those East Boulder businesses and industrial jobs to more affordable surrounding communities is a major concern um, that we heard a lot about. So then, you know, how do we tie these pieces together and make it all work? Um, we look at the transportation network. So in general, um, there's support in the community for increasing and improving connections for all different modes of mobility in East Boulder. And I think a recognition that the, the network out here is lacking. People want more walkable areas. So we need the facilities to support that, but we also need the places or destinations for people to walk to. And then East Boulder has a lot of um, surface parking and maybe not surprisingly, there's some tension around this topic. Some people would like to see less parking and want to use that space for something else. Um, but for others, the availability of parking in East Boulder is a major contributor to why they have located their business in this area. And um, that kind of access is important. Commuter traffic along Arapaho, I think it was mentioned earlier tonight, but um, it was certainly mentioned a lot in our, in our engagement window. And it's important to recognize that into the future, um, this roadway will continue to be a major corridor for commuters coming um, to Boulder from the east. There's some concern that this traffic could increase as redevelopment happens. And then um, similarly to some of the feedback we've received on housing, community members really support um, the idea of 15 minute neighborhoods as, as a way to help reduce trips. So, you know, lots of great input. I think um, when I started working on this project, I really wasn't sure how the balance of, of workspace and a desire for new housing was gonna shake out in East Boulder. Um, but I think, you know, one of my biggest takeaways from this last phase of engagement was that people really value East Boulder as a place to do business, 
to come up with new ideas and to build a supportive network for local businesses and for people to be successful. Um, I think part of that network is providing housing that people who work in the area can afford, um, but community members wanna be really strategic and intentional about where that housing should be located. So that's what we're gonna work on tonight. Um, I'm gonna share the draft concept for the subcommunity in a moment, in a moment um, but just to be clear about our process, we're still at a draft phase and we'll be iterating this draft through boards and community members, um, city staff and our working group until we get to a place where all the parties have a level of comfort and confidence in the plan that boards and council can move forward with adoption. I'm gonna grab a quick sip of water. Okay. So um, coming out of that winter, engagement session, one of the big ideas driving our concept is the idea that East Boulder could be the city's steam zone. So I think the working group has been searching for a way to identify East Boulder as its own place in the city. And this is one concept that we've come up with. Um, the idea actually came from a conversation with the city's airport manager who mentioned um, that the airport hosts STEM programs for, for CU. So STEM, STEM is a, a educational program that focuses on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But we've modified that for East Boulder to incorporate the arts and our important medical uses in the area. Um, one working group member also recommended that we call it the, the stream zone. So um, to also incorporate recreation since we have um, so many recreational businesses located in East Boulder, and it's kind of reflective of being near the confluence of Boulder and South Boulder Creek. Um, so that was a pretty cool idea as well. So that takes us to um, some key concepts for change in the area. On the Eastern end of Arapaho, um, there's a lot of interest in the community for creating a better gateway or entry into the city from the East. And we've been working with two graduate students at UC Denver to consider um, very uh, long-term visions for the future of the area around Valmont Power Plant. This concept um, will kind of build on that legacy of energy production to inspire a place we're calling the Energy Innovation District. So um, this, this end of town would remain really industrially focused. And then moving west, the next key concept is the um, mobility hub at 55th and Arapaho. So as many of you know, as part of the East Boulder project, we're doing um, some greater detailed planning for the area around 55th and Arapaho and looking at different redevelopment and mobility concepts that could help this area evolve. That project is grant funded and um, we have a great consultant team working on this. Right now we're in an, we're in an engagement phase asking for um, community preferences and feedback around transit-oriented development concepts. So then um, building off the opportunities at 55th and Arapaho, we look to Flatiron Business Park as an incubator zone. And I think this idea of incubator is meant to inspire both the growth for new and existing businesses, as well as um, the growth of community in the area. And then moving up 55th, um, we have this area around Valmont City Park that is really focused on transforming into a live work play neighborhood. So we're building off the idea of pairing new housing with existing green space, looking for ways to bring live work options into the community and really wanting to connect that San Lazaro neighborhood into the city and into a great future for the area. So what does that mean um, for our mobility network? So we know uh, Arapahoe today and well into the future is going to continue to be a key connector into and out of the city, but now 55th Street becomes much more important for connecting these other areas of investment and building a spine for a more walkable and mobile community. And it also calls attention to Valmont Road as a place where existing and future residents will likely travel more frequently. So how do we make that experience easy, intuitive, and um, maybe just a little more, more pleasant to look at? So we've taken those general concepts and built a draft land use plan for your feedback. Um, there are eight areas of change identified. Jean Sanson and I are gonna talk through the land use changes being proposed and look at what the TMP currently includes for these areas. 
So the first is the station area at 55th and Arapahoe. For this area, we're actually proposing a totally new land use category, which we're calling mixed use TOD or mixed use transit oriented development. This land use would provide a mix of residential, office, commercial, and retail, as well as some light industrial space that will support and is supported by the regional mobility hub that is planned at the site as part of the future vision for BRT along Arapahoe. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Jean to um, take a look at these TMP projects here. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, Kathleen. So to the left, the map that we're looking at includes planned bicycle and pedestrian improvements um, and missing sidewalks, which we um, hope to make uh, better connections across, as you note, in some of the, the orange lines. But the green lines really denote where today the TMP is calling for multi-use path connections. Um, and then I'll also point out that along Arapahoe, the concept, the long range concept for Arapahoe, um, and particularly because we have some new members, was developed as part of the East Arapahoe Transportation Plan back in 2018. We're really looking at transforming this commuter corridor, noting that not only are we serving commuters, but we're also serving people who are living, working, um, playing in the area today and will into the future. So the idea is to reconfigure um, Arapahoe, which is currently a six lane arterial, to um, allow for curbside access for businesses, for vehicles, and use those curbside lanes as well for our planned bus rapid transit between Boulder and communities to the east. You'll note that blue dot um, really just identifies, it's a label for what we're calling a mobility hub. And I will say when we're speaking about a mobility hub, we're not necessarily talking about say, for example, a large table mesa park and ride. We don't envision a lot of parking in this area. What we do envision is high frequency connections via transit, as well as good bicycle and pedestrian connections and services such as e-bikes, potentially e-scooters at some point in the future, um, and great you know, micro-mobility ways to connect um, areas north and south. Um, the, the map on the right shows planned and existing bus service. Um, I will say I have to um, recognize that COVID has, has had a severe impact on bus service in this area. Um, up until COVID, uh, the Flatiron Business Park was served by one of the uh, Flatiron Fire routes, which has since been suspended. Um, we've also seen a reduction in service in some of the local routes that serve 55th and the Flatiron Business Park. Um, but I will say we're working um, very hard with RTD to restore that service and expand it into the future. Um, for example, we'd like to see the HOP bus service extend from Boulder Junction across Pearl Parkway and down 55th Street. Um, I will say one thing, um, just because we didn't include it in the plan bike and pet improvement map, but um, 55th Street is identified in our transportation master plan as part of the low stress bike network for a protected bicycle facility. So um, that's what I have to say about this area. Okay. We're gonna um, move up and the, the next area we're looking at is on the east side of Belmont City Park. So bound by um, Belmont Road, 55th and Pearl Parkway. So today this area is designated light industrial and we're proposing a change to mixed use industrial. So this change will direct a greater mix of light industrial, residential and re retail uses to the area. It's envisioned that the future redevelopment would incorporate both a uh, horizontal and a vertical mix. Um, and as far as the connections shown in the transportation master plan, um, what you're seeing here are some pro proposed improvements to the bicycle and pedestrian network, um, as well as some of the, the bus service you see along Pearl Parkway connecting to 55th. Um, so this next concept isn't a land use change. This is actually uh, looking at the San Lazaro Mobile Home Park for annexation. The area is eligible for annexation. Um, it's privately owned and our annexation process and requirements can be uh, really expensive for property owners. So staff is currently considering ways to provide some assistance that would help guarantee long-term affordability of the area while also gaining key improvements um, that we've heard residents strongly support. 
And I guess what I would add here is that we are looking at a designated bike route through San Lazaro connecting to some of the multi-use path connections and projects that are happening to the north, connecting all the way up to Gun Barrel and into town to the west. So now um, we're hopping over to the west side of Valmont City Park and looking at an area between Valmont Road and Pearl Street. So today the mapping for this area includes some community industrial, um, a swath of open space other, which we believe is uh, misaligned with some of the existing conditions along ditches in the area, and then some light industrial as well. The draft concept for land use here is again a mixed use industrial category intended to retain key business space, but build opportunity for new residential and retail with access to the park and the existing residential community to the north. For both this area and the other mixed use industrial on the east side of the park, um, we've gotten feedback from our working group and the housing advisory board that these two areas have uh, great potential to provide the kinds of housing that might be attractive to a lot of commuters in the area. Okay, and I think there's um, there's been a request that I describe some of the colors that we're looking at on these maps. So, and there are a lot, so I apologize. Yeah. And I'm happy to do so. Um, so again, starting to the left, when we're looking at planned bike and pedestrian improvements in this area, um, some of the orange is denoting where we would want to see um, missing links in the sidewalk system built. Um, the dash red line is looking at, again, low stress um, bicycle facilities such as protected bike lanes um, on to the north of this area and um, a designated mobility hub um, at Pearl and Foothills. Um, I will say that, um, and I'm moving over to the planned and existing bus and transit, you know, one thing to think about is um, while we are hoping to get a lot of the service back on Pearl Parkway connecting um, the east into the center of, of the city, we have very limited service today on Belmont or even planned service on Belmont. Um, the, 208 run, the 208, which is that, that I guess it's the red line there, um, provides hourly service, but it's fairly limited. So as we start to look at perhaps changing land uses um, along Valmont, we might wanna think about how to better serve that via transit. So this next concept is for a light industrial area located um, just west of the KOA Lake Recreation Site. To, Today, this is light industrial, um, and the majority of the, this land is located in the high hazard and conveyance zones of the floodplain. So one idea that received both you know, positive and negative feedback during the engagement process was setting a long-term vision to evolve lands in these areas of the floodplain to green space. And so this area is currently outside city limits, so we've been um, meeting with colleagues at the county to consider this change. But the intention is to expand the recreational space near KOA Lake and provide um, some additional passive green space for um, workers and potential residents in the area. So um, in looking at this area, I would say um, one of the things I would note about this particular node is that it's very well served by connected multi-use paths um, in all directions. Um, when we're looking at the, and we'll get to the Flatirons Business Park in a minute, but just real quickly since it's showing up on these maps, when we're looking at the green lines um, through the Flatiron Business Park, yeah, thank you, Kathleen. Um, what you're looking at to the north would be the designation for a neighborhood green street. So in this example, the city um, would, uh, would work with um, the, the property owners to um, put signage and wayfinding in place to create some traffic calming to let people know that bicycles are act and pedestrians are actively using this. Um, and then the dashed green lines denote where we would like to see additional multi-use path connections. Um, again, looking at existing and planned bus routes, I had mentioned that some of the service that um, you're looking at, the pink and the purple lines through the Flatirons Business Park um, has been suspended through COVID, but we hope to reinstate much of it. So that takes us to Flatiron Business Park. Um, Again, this draft proposes a change from light industrial to mixed use industrial in order to create a place that allows for more retail, 
um, which is a key desire of community members and allows for a horizontal and vertical mix of residential uses. The working group met this um, just this past Wednesday, and there was an interest in expanding this area of change um, and, and draft uh, land use change out to both sides of the 55th Street corridor. So today we're kind of, um, oh, I'm pointing at the wrong thing. Today we're kind of um, looking at an area of change that I sort of call it the island. There's like barriers on, on all sides. Um, but the working group really wanted to expand this area of change to include um, some of the office park um, that's on the other side of 55th and then all of this land here. And I'm going to say I covered this in the prior slide, Kathleen. That sounds good. Okay, um, so this next change, uh, we're down on Arapahoe now, and um, this would align the land use plan with the recently approved site and use review application for the water view project. Um, so the change is from late industrial to a mixed use residential area along East Arapahoe, just west of South Boulder Creek. Um, so the one thing I would say um, specific to this geography is um, one of the things that the city is investing in today um, in the coming year are um, improvements to the multi-use path along Arapahoe. So filling in gaps where they exist and widening sidewalks where they need to be widened to allow for bicycle and pedestrian travel. Along with that project, we're also making some bus stop enhancements. One of the bus stops that we have identified is the bus stop on the south side of um, Arapahoe, eastbound at Old Tail Road. So we're really trying to create better connections on the north and south side um, at this particular location. We hope to have um, uh, that project construction constructed in 2022. And then this is the, the last change, um, but this was actually not tested in our last round of engagement, um, but sort of came through as we reviewed some of the community input for changes along Arapaho. Um, this change is a small area that is currently used uh, for storage facilities and has a light industrial land use to mixed use residential as a way to create a continuous area for residential opportunity between the JCC and 63rd Street. Um, which, which terminates at the, the Columbine Mobile Home Park on the south side of Arapaho. So that's these guys right here. And probably not much to add here um, in regard to transportation that we haven't already covered. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, that covers the changes we're looking at in, in this draft concept. Um, we're closing in on the end of our fourth phase of the project, and the plan deliverable for this phase of work uh, will be a final land use plan. Um, so as a reminder, there are some key issues to think about as we go into the discussion. Um, but now, um, I'm sure folks have a lot of questions about the presentation, so I'm going to ask uh, Jean Gassa to moderate the questions from board members um, for the next sort of 15 minutes or so. And then, um, you know, I think we're hoping to keep that to clarifying questions. And then we'll switch over to our work session. Um, in the work session, we'll ask each board member to answer these two questions that are up on the screen now. And the hope is that your input tonight will help us evolve um, this draft concept plan, begin creating that connections plan to build off of the TMP, and help us really define what a mixed use industrial neighborhood looks like, um, what that feels like and how people and vehicles move around it. So I'm gonna stop the share and turn it back over to um, Jean Getza. Great, thanks Kathleen. Um, so David and Tila, I, again, as Kathleen said, I think really just let's focus on any kind of really clarifying questions. Um, that will help folks respond. And then we'll, we're gonna put those questions back up on the screen, let you think about them, because I'd like for you to just jot down some, some um, quick responses on those so that we can go around and capture those quickly once the questions are over. So um, with that, um, you guys don't have the raise hand function. So if you want to, just let us know where, you know, wave at us um, if you've got a, a, a clarifying question and I'll try to 
keep track. I'm going to jump in with what might be a dumb question um, very quickly because I'm not entirely clear what the different flavors. Are. I, I know what the colors mean and what the labels mean on the map, but what what the difference is between community industrial versus general industrial versus light industrial? Can you you can just you can just point me to something and I can look at while while other questions are happening, but I couldn't find an easy way to figure out what these different uh, descriptions of land uses are. Yeah, yeah. So the general industrial is um, kind of our heaviest industrial category. It's for heavier um, manufacturing or um, like right now, some of the, the stuff that's in that general industrial category today are the, the Valmont power plant, um, Western disposal. Um, so, so big, big stuff, a lot of space kind of things um, are that general industrial category. The light industrial category is where um, I think we've seen a lot of those changes. So, um, you know, intended to house um, sort of lighter manufacturing um, and some flex space, um, but we've seen a lot of transition of that space into office space recently. And then the community industrial, um, I think is a, a newer category and it's really intended to preserve um, some of that service industrial type of space. So the, the zones that fall into that community industrial category are typically the industrial service zones. So um, those are things that are more like um, um, auto service businesses, um, um, like vacuum repair is something that people reference all the time. Okay. Um, I'm going to yep. stop you there because Sarah just sent me the link to something to look at so that we don't have to, unless this is helpful for other people, um, but just so I can look without sort of having you top of mind try to describe them, just so I can have a, have a look sure. at it. Um, sure. Unless other people want to, her to continue with the description, I'm happy to, to look at this and I'll find more other things. Well, that's it. Those are the three oh. main industrial categories. Well, I had the same question for what the business categories were, so it's a helpful thing. For okay. <laughs> And, and I guess my follow up for that is, so is this mixed use industrial, this new category, more uh, a codification of what's already happening? Or, or no, the trend you know we're what? already seeing happen? Or are we really envisioning some brand new flavor or something that hasn't been happening yet? So we don't have a lot of examples of mixed use industrial um, in other parts of Boulder. And I think that's part of what we'd really like to hear from the group tonight is, you know, how are people envisioning what a mixed use industrial neighborhood really looks like? Um, in the BBCP, that land use category is left um, pretty broad and leaves it up to some of these planning projects to give more guidance. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's not a new category that was created for this plan, like the mixed use TOD was, um, but I think it's a category without a lot of, um, description or, or bounds. And so we're hoping to provide that through this, through this plan. Okay, thank you. Oh. Did you okay. want me to help at all? Actually, David, that probably would be helpful. I'm getting, my sound is coming in and out and I'm hoping right. I can catch everybody, but I think I, I saw Sarah's hand and I wasn't sure if I caught others' hands. Uh, Sarah, then Lisa, then Mark. Great, thank um, you. Lisa, why don't you go first? Cause you raised your hand first. Sorry about that, David. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I would. <laughs> um, so my question is kind of uh, off of the industrial as well. And it, it's actually a question that, um, and I can't remember what, what specific thing was before us, but that came up in planning board, um, which was whether or not we have any data, um, and, and this may be held by someone else in the city on kind of what's changing uh, with industrial uses um, in the city and specifically maybe in East Boulder. So, so we know that there's some of this movement out and some of some changes in this use um, that, that are kind of impacting these ideas about um, the new designation, like the mixed industrial. Um, and I'm just wondering, do we have any information on like who we're losing and how fast we're losing them and who's moving in and how fast they're moving in? And, um, you know, I, I just wonder if that data exists. Um, so I'd, I'd have to 
dig in um, with our information resources group to find out what we can kind of track in the way that you're asking for information. Um, but a lot of the um, a lot of our understanding about these changes right now is built off of conversations with property owners and business owners that um, our staff has had, that we've had in the working group, and then also as part of the 55th and Arapaho um, stamp project, we um, have um, economic and planning systems, which is a economic and market consultant. Um, they did as part of the existing conditions work, um, a um, market study and analysis for us of um, the area and that provided um, a lot of input as, as well. Okay, great. Yeah, that, that's just something that, I don't know if anxiety is quite the right word, but my, my understanding of what's happening citywide and then in specific areas that have more industrial use is also somewhat subjective and, and that always makes me a little bit anxious. Um, I guess maybe anxious is the right word because I don't know how valid I don't have data to like know if if the the sense that I have or the feelings that I have are, are rooted in reality or um, if I just happen to have heard from certain people or happen to observe certain trends that are, are swaying me. So I guess this is me just reiterating something we talked about before, which is um, a hunger for some data if it exists or if it's possible to collect. Um, and I know everyone's very stretched uh, to just kind of understand what what's actually happening on the ground. Um, to help us know if, if what we feel is happening is in fact what's occurring. So thank you for that. Sarah. Thank you, David. Um, so my question is actually about the projected jobs. <clears throat> All three of the concept plans that were present or concepts that were presented have 30,000 plus jobs uh, projected up from the current 17,000. And I'm, is that the, is that 30,000 plus what the city had projected whether or not there was a Boulder Valley, I mean, an East Boulder subcommunity planning process, or are, is that a reflection of the land use changes being proposed? So the um, the um, no change trend option is based on the projections that we did as part of the um, 2015 BBCP update. Um, and so that's based on um, city data and um, the existing zoning and trends that we've seen over the last 10 years. The concept plan, so there's the three concepts, the job projections in um, those three concepts are based on the model that we created in that ARC urban tool. And um, so that is based on those land use changes. And what it does is takes um, uh, square footage per job and assigns that to each of those land use changes and then projects um, how many jobs you could fit into an area um, if we were to make that change. Okay, I appreciate that, that's very helpful. Thanks, and Mark, did you want to ask you a question? And then more hands can go up at some point. And then Lupita. Lupita. Hi, um, on, uh, I noticed I was reading the, the memo and on page 13, uh, there's a line in there where it says, city staff is currently working with the Open Space Board of Trustees, OSBT, to rethink the o Open Space Other or OSO designation on the industrially developed land in this area. So I, I wanna be educated or corrected. My understanding of OSO is that it's a confusing term. It has no real technical definition. It's maybe aspirational, but I'm surprised that we would be going to OSBT to change a designation on property that is not, for all I know, is not even city owned. Um, and so my question is, is am I right that OSO is a, I would say it's a confusing term, but it's an inexact, is it an inexact term that creates some problems in various planning projects around the city? 
So help me understand what that means and why we're going to OSBT in this particular case. Yes, so I think, um, you know, from my sense uh, from development review staff in the city attorney's office um, and um, planning board as well is yes, that that OSO category creates a lot of confusion and um, frequently um, presents uh, area that based on the green color on the map looks like it's intended for open space, but there's actually no intention for open space in those areas. And so a lot of that OSO land um, was drawn before 1981 on a hand map and then got digitized. And so there's a lot of errors in, in that. Um, and so, um, yes, we're working with OSMP staff to clean up some of that stuff. Um, and my understanding is that we do need um, OSBT approval to make any changes to land that is designated open space in the BBCP. Wow, that we actually have to get OSBT approval. It's not approved. The city doesn't own it and it's, it's not open space. The, the comprehensive plan has a stipulation that um, we have to consult the Open Space Board of Trustees on anything related to open open space land uses in the comp plan. And so while you're right, Mark, the OSO is a little different than the OS acquired or the OS development rights. Um, we, we typically do have that um, circle back just for uh, feedback on those. All right, thank you. Great, um, Lupita? And then John, I think you wanted to go. Okay, and we'll, we probably like to try to keep these to pretty quick clarifying questions so we can move on to the discussion soon. Just questions without, uh, without uh, too much additional comment is great. Yes, my question had to do with the feedback uh, from the community. They had any, any discussion specifically regarding uh, the interest from the San Lazaro community to be engaged and either com like commercial or in the industrial um, sections. Uh, just trying to see whether there will be opportunities for employment for the people who live in that area. Are they already engaged in those uh, jobs or uh, was there any discussion regarding the possibilities of having a closer connection to that, to that area in terms of employment? Um, we have had a, a, um, a couple of conversations with folks that live there, and then we also have uh, two community connectors who participate on our working group who um, foster a lot of um, uh, communication between the working group and city staff and, and San Lazaro residents. The, the idea of um, jobs, I will say, hasn't come up that frequently in those conversations. It's really been a lot more focused on um, some of their immediate needs and concerns um, related to their water quality, um, the sidewalks, lighting. Um, some of the, the real basics are um, what they're really um, trying to focus our attention on. Um, but there have been, um, I would say, you know, a lot of interest in um, better connecting that area to some of the local parks um, that they're really close to, but don't maybe access as much um, as other community groups. Um, and then um, real, real interest in having recreation programs and after school activities for kids in the neighborhood. Can I follow up with another question? Yes. So what is the right avenue to kind of bring this particular issue up? Because I don't think these communities necessarily know that, you know, they should be just responding to what happened or so just keep all of their needs within the community in terms of, you know, access to maybe clean water or just the benefits that we'll get from annexation. But in terms of how they can more uh, legitimately integrate into this whole zone, because they could be, you know, really enriching this area. Um, I, I think businesses, um, you know, ethnic restaurants that would serve the needs of the workers in that area, for example, 
integrating more of the cultures of this community, which is very, you know, we have a few enclaves of like this, but I think they don't necessarily will come up uh, if you just, if, if you don't give them a little an opportunity or just even a little bit of a, of a nudge, say, no, this is really possible to be on the table. Um, and so I don't know if necessarily with community connectors without knowing that this is something that's a possibility will happen organically because these are not communities that uh, uh, traditionally being been said in the in, in the middle of discussion. Sorry about that. Apparently, I cannot decline the call. Okay, um, the question is, uh, uh, what mechanisms can be and uh, additional mechanisms can be used to engage the San Lazaro community in these discussions towards annexation and uh, how their neighborhood is going to look? Is that uh, no, I think it's further than that. It's not how it's going to look. It is about how they can legitimately become a contributing uh, section to the way that the whole um, um, is boulder steam or stream, whatever it ends up being, uh, is going to look like because it could be in one of those places that instead of being a recipient of benefits, it could be a true contribution to the development of this section. I think it's a very different, mm -hmm. it's a very different uh, direction. So what, mm -hmm. I, what I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm encouraging the city to do is that really guide the community to feel empowered, which is often the opposite of what they get, uh, to really see how they can contribute. So it's not just about, you know, receive whatever benefits from the annexation will may come, but how they can contribute to this uh, East Boulder Center to become something, you know, truly new and truly inclusive uh, because you, you could take advantage of that population. They have a lot to offer, but just don't have any opportunities in the past to really uh, uh, do that. And here is, is, is the prime opportunity because they're the only residents there. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, Lupita, thank you. Um, and did we have one more question before we move on to the discussion topics? Because John had what? a question, I think. Okay. So, and then we, I don't know if anybody else had. John, you'll need to unmute. Just wanted to, as uh, as the liaison who's shown up at a bunch of these meetings, I just wanted to add a, a couple comments to staff. Uh, what they'd reported. One is that the uh, the meetings have not discussed the open space other issue that Mark raised. And uh, I agree that uh, it is a, a contentious issue, but it's absolutely one that needs to be dealt with properly and not uh, shoved out of the way. The other I wanted to mention is that we have not talked about the Boulder Airport area, which is part of the uh, East Boulder study area and potentially very significant in the bigger picture as well. But, but that just hasn't been addressed yet. And I think Ryan has his hand up as well. Okay, great. Thanks, this, this is my first comment. So, so I hope you give me some uh, flexibility here if I do this wrong. Um, thanks for having me uh, at this first meeting. Uh, related question to the one just two, two before, um, I understand the city council uh, adopted or passed the racial equity plan recently. And I'm just wondering if there are any measures or, I don't know, manifestations of that plan that, that you have been able to add into this plan, you know, if there's any, any connection or insights that come from the, the racial equity plan. Thank you. Yeah, I think as we're all um, kind of taking hold of that plan, we're looking for ways to, you know, at, at least in, in long range planning in my department, um, think about how we approach engagement differently. So I think that's been a big part of it. But, um, you know, the other thing that we're really trying to figure out and look at is how do we use the data that we have to measure equity and um, measure how the impacts of some of these changes will um, affect different populations and groups that live in the city. So um, that's definitely something that we're, we're studying and I think um, learning throughout the, the process of this plan. Thanks, Kathleen. Okay, um, with that, so we are at 722. What I'd like to do, Kathleen, can you put the, um, the discussion questions back up? 
Um, we've got one that's really more geared toward um, design qualities, characteristics, the, the land use types of um, aspects of these, of now that you've gotten a good sense of um, some of these proposed changes. And then the second one's really more about mobility improvements. So if folks have a pencil, um, um, I'd like for you to just take a moment to look at these and think about um, a, a response or two, one, you know, one or two key points that we can go through pretty succinctly. Um, we've got 13 members and we wanna make sure that we hear from everybody. And I think that it will really help both us and you all to hear from each other um, about your thoughts. So um, also don't think this is your only chance. What we'd like to do is get everyone's responses to each of these in a pretty quick and succinct way. So try not to, um, I'm just gonna ask you, try not to go too far into the commentary, but let's just try to capture these to see where we have um, like comments. If if somebody has said something that you agree with, you can just say that and that'll be super helpful for us on the other side of the notes. After we get through um, both um, everyone with each of these questions, then we'll open it up for some more discussion to take a deeper dive. Kathleen and Jean are gonna be um, taking notes on this and there's probably gonna be some questions that just come up that we'd like to dig a little deeper into. So thinking about this first question, um, feedback that would be really helpful would include like really uh, uh, more about how we integrate this housing with some of the existing industrial uses in a way that works to achieve that 15 minute neighborhood, 15 minute walkable neighborhood really for the residents and those working in, their, in the area. As Kathleen mentioned, you know, we have some of this in Boulder, but not a lot. So what we're um, trying to create is something that might look a little different or be a little new. And so your perceptive perceptions about um, that integration of housing um, to shape and describe that next piece of work will be really helpful. Um, on the, the next question, so what are the mobility improvements that can help evolve this um, commuter-based area into a live, work, play community um, while maintaining that support for business needs? That's, I mean, we've heard a lot about, and you saw um, Jean described um, the improvements that are planned. We've heard a lot about the need for bike and pedestrian and transit improvements, but um, recognizing that there will still be existing businesses in this area that will have deliveries and trucks and equipment um, and commuters that will have um, some need for parking. We would really like to um, get some thoughts about how we might uh, best integrate those mobility functions. So what I'm gonna do is I have uh, listed all of you out, um, both the planning board members and the tab members by last name. And so I'm gonna go reverse alpha um, and call on folks. So I'm gonna tee up Peter Vitali and Alex Weinheimer first, and we'll just go down. Well, um, I'll, I'll tee you up. If you can give me like that minute, um, well, we'll do question A first, um, and then on question B, I'll go the other way. So, George, I figured with your second uh, second meeting, I wasn't going to make you go first. So we're going to, um, but I know Peter Peter will be ready. I'll be ready. So, Although, Jean, um, I had uh, two kids just bust in here just as you were telling me what you were teeing me up for. Okay. And um, they were asking me if I heard the dog barking. It wasn't it annoying. I said yes. <laughs> so I didn't so, hear. You. Um, so our first, our first question is really about those design qualities and characteristics that will support that future 15 minute neighborhood in the evolving industrial region. Um, so we'll go Peter and then Alex and then Lisa and then Ryan. Um, and, if, and if you keep going, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this so that we, uh, we try to keep moving. Okay, am I up? You're up. Okay, I think it's the walkability and the uh, width of sidewalk and the ability to move as a pedestrian through these spaces and that kind of trail of breadcrumbs of finding that next thing. And I know that's a tall order in a spot like this in these places that we're trying to make more human scale that weren't designed that way. But um, you know, the experience from the from the pedestrian point of view, and I think that's key. And holding the the buildings and the retail holding the street in the right way. We just saw this with Ball the other day. 
and um, you know we fought to try to maintain uh, something on the sidewalk but you know all we got was trees which you know in a little park which will help so i'd go with the uh, experience of the walker thanks peter alex Thoughts? i think mixing housing throughout the entire sub community is a really important thing i love that live work play was included in this i like how when uh, a, a restaurant can work for an employee during lunch it can also work as a per resident at dinner time so making sure that the, that we have uh, residential in all parts of the park, the area, including um, like Boulder Business Park. The easiest types of trips to, to change from driving to uh, active modes of transportation are short ones. And in Boulder, our community trips are often pretty long. And so having this mix of residents in there who are gonna take those short trips, most of our, almost 80% of our trips are not commute trips. So having a ton of people living there who can, who can utilize, take, advantage of things within a walking distance. Um, and then I think there's plenty of land for this. I get the sensitivities of businesses, but in 2018, the city looked at the utilization of parking throughout the city. And they found that office buildings, we were over parked by 24 to 33% in most places. And at, in industrial places, we were over parked 46 to 60%. Meaning that in a place like East Boulder, where we have a lot of office and industrial, we probably have way too much parking that is, uh, we have, land uses that are only utilized part of the day during and part of the week. And then the parking is like that and is some places, some parking is, isn't, isn't utilized at all. Great. Um, my sound cut out there. So Alex, I'm, I'm assuming since you unmuted yourself, you are done. Um, thank you for those. Um, next up will be Lisa and then Ryan and then Sarah and then Mark. Um, yeah, so to echo the previous comments, um, I totally agree on the pedestrian and also I'd say the bike environment. Um, and I would say to the extent not just putting in sidewalks, but making um, sidewalks and bike lanes as protected and welcoming as we can. Uh, there are a lot of areas where it's not very pleasant to walk and then people just won't walk. Um, and then off of that, I would say legibility of the landscape. So being able to see where your next point is, you know, being able to understand that, oh, I, I can move along the edge of this kind of parking wasteland to get over there to then get to that brewery, um, you know, without having to know exactly what that path is, I think would be very helpful um, so that people who are coming into the space park once and then walk the rest of the time. Um, accessibility in general, so for everyone, um, but also to make sure that we are um, opening up to all you know abilities and ages and you know you can bring whoever you want there and they're going to be able to move around easily um you know whether it's somebody in a wheelchair or um, somebody with a stroller or somebody with an injury or an older person um and then in terms of uh the question around kind of housing and how do you make it live work play um i would say going vertical and by that i don't necessarily mean tall um, but, you know, figuring out where it's appropriate to have like an apartment above um, some kind of a light um, commercial use or something like that, where it's not going to be super disruptive or having an artist's loft, um, you know, having industrial workspace adjacent to housing, things like that. Um, and then making sure that we're sprinkling what I think we actually have a lot of out there already, which is really cool. Um, and that is third places, you know, so places like the breweries, like the restaurants, um, you know, and making sure that those are, um, you know, in there and kind of sprinkled around. So maybe there's some nodes um, where there are a bunch of them where you kind of go to hang out and spend some time in a more open area and people watch. Um, but also that, you know, there's a coffee shop right downstairs from your apartment if you do live there. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, Ryan. Okay, I think I have maybe three points. Um, I, so I heard the premise was sort of like, well, okay, we you might we might care about bike biking and pedestrian, but but keep in mind these are businesses and we need to worry about motor vehicle parking. So I guess I'd offer um, let's have best in class transportation demand management strategies here that really encourage uh, de deliveries and workers to use pooled pooled modes to every extent possible. Um, there's an EV revolution taking place, obviously. We can use EV charging and, and the electricity that people might get at different rates as a lever for transportation demand management. And I think you got a, you have a chance here to do something that's, that's kind of a interesting test bed of how do you make, how do you make that work? Uh, also microtransit. I mean, there's just, this, there's like a lot of, um, 
lot of, I think there's a hundred different microtransit-ish, a hundred different microtransit kind of exper experiments are going on around the country right now. So I'd really encourage that we think about those if, you know, we really want to focus on the motor vehicle side. But um, one final thing on, on bikes and peds, I, you know, the, um, thinking of this area also as a corridor, if you're going from North Boulder to South Boulder or, or vice versa, and making sure that, you, you know, we could do everything possible to make that really smooth and frictionless um, would, be, would be a good one too. Ryan, I think you, you kind of jumped ahead to question B, but um, if you had anything more sort of land use related and wanted to add, um, that would be fine or we can circle back. Okay, one more thing then. It, it, I, this was actually sort of a question, but I was wondering, that's related to a comment. And I was wondering, uh, I missed this, but the, the time horizon that you're, we're, we're imagining forward and then what are the assumptions about pop, population trends in Boulder and growing, shrinking, something else? Have we thought about it? And I'm reminded of a, a New York Times article last September that referred to a um, kind of like a climate migration, you know, national um, sort of a pattern. And that we're expecting a pretty big a pressure on influx, like serious pressure on influx into the Boulder Valley area over, over the course of, I don't know, decades or so. Are we working on that? Because this could be, you know, there could be a lot of interesting and challenging problems uh, incumbent in that. So that's the problem. I, did, I don't know the solution exactly, but I just wanted to yeah, throw that out there. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, so we'll have Sarah and then Mark and then Lupita and then Robert Hutch. Um, okay, so I'm going to focus on design qualities and characteristics. And I agree with um, Peter and the transportation folks who talked about <clears throat> pedestrian and short, making it easy to get from point A to point B, not in your car. Um, but I think that uh, one of the challenges will be is designing actually a neighborhood um, that has a diversity of housing, not just um, either a bunch of single family homes or a bunch of high rise apartment in Boulder, what constitutes high rise apartment buildings. Um, and that we really need to look at these areas. When we talk about mixed use, we tend to be talking about apartments and re um, commercial. And I think we need to talk about, I mean, I use the term mixed use to mean a diversity of housing types. And I think that that's very, very important so that it, it really feels like a neighborhood to people. And I actually think that the opportunity <clears throat> to um, address the challenges um, in terms of these transitional space, spaces between a new neighborhood and in an industrial area can maybe be captured in addressing the cont contiguity rule that we have that allows um, uh, uh, um, residential housing to be built in additional industrial areas if one sixth of or one side is connected to an existing industrial area. And I think this might be a good opportunity in the sub community planning process to really, uh, I don't want to say eliminate that, but address that um, so that you really do delineate between areas that are going to remain light industrial and areas that are going to be um, some mix of industrial and light industrial. Um, and I think the other, this is not necessarily a design issue, but uh, in these new neighborhoods, we're gonna need a lot of trees so that we don't end up with um, um, urban heat islands. Um, and I walk that area all the time and there are no trees. <laughs> they're very, they're, there are trees in places, but there's a lot of part of the bike path that has no trees. And I think we really need to make that a central planning part of the planning process. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, Mark, and then Lupita, and then um, Robert. Well, the first thing I want to say is I really love hearing the planning board talk in such creative and intelligent ways about transportation. Super exciting. So um, I really appreciated Lisa's comments. Um, the, in, in terms of my answer to question A, I want us to break and throw away a lot of our preconceived notions about where people want to live. There are cities everywhere. Every city has zones where artists, bohemians, all sorts of different people live above the auto repair shop, live above the store, live above, they live above all sorts of things on the ground level. And, and it doesn't just have to be just a coffee shop. People can live above all sorts of 
places, office spaces, the insurance agency, whatever. So I want us to, um, I think we spend a lot of time kind of deciding, well, that would be an inappropriate place for someone to live. Well, I think we, we need to have housing and we need to let uh, those people that, that want to and can afford, or maybe it's affordability that drives them there, uh, live, in, live in spaces that we in Boulder don't, we make a lot of assumptions that, well, no one's gonna wanna live there. Well, I disagree. Um, in terms of the second question, uh, a lot has been said. Actually, Mark, you can hold because I wanted I want us to do two. I was hoping we'd do we'd quickly go through the first question and oh, then go through the, the second oh, okay. one. That's okay. Well, that's just the first question. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Very good. All right, um, Lupita, and then Hutch, and then John, and then Tila. Okay. So. I, I just wanted to share my thoughts in terms of something that I think we could uh, do in this area to really enhance um, with something new in the city. And this is really based on models that I have observed in other places that have worked very well. I, I would like to see this area to have spaces where we create a destination, not just for work, but also for people be bringing people together and you know bring out both our communities as well as outside communities so a place to come so even if it's an industrial area maybe on the weekends have um a section and just for those of you who have hopefully visited los angeles uh, uh near lacma the los angeles county museum of art there is a section with lots of trucks with different kinds of foods come in it's a destination uh my son just look forward to going to Los Angeles to go just to go see the food trucks. In Denver, we have the uh, the art district in Santa Fe, and these are things that only happen, you know, during certain times of the week or the month. I think this could be one area that we can really revitalize, not just at this industrial area, but really bring something new to the city. Uh, again, and if you think about potential places for some of our residents that could have businesses. This is something that really could uh, add to our uh, diversity as well. So that's my two points on that. Great. Thank you. Okay, um, Robert, you're up next. I, I, I think I, a lot's been said. So I, I only have two things to add. One is that uh, I'd like to really double down on Lupita's comments that uh, if you're going to have neighborhoods, what are their centers? What are, what are their appeal? Where do people hang, hang out? Where do people get some of the quotidian stuff done? And, and I'm not sure in a sea of tilt up uh, buildings and, and uh, very large parking lots, as Alex said, uh, where you do that, but there, there's, there, there's plenty of slices of time which is sort of getting into my second point when the, these things are very much underused and, and maybe there's ways to share space or double down on space or add uh, chaos or trucks or whatever, as Lupita was saying, that provide mm -hmm. some degree of destinations. Uh, and as, as I've watched sort of neighborhoods revitalize, and this sort of is a revitalization dynamic, uh, you, you start with some of these sort of almost pop-up destinations, and then you provide some flexibility, as Alex said, for, for some people to be there sort of round the clock. And then over time, it becomes uh, clearer as you do more planning and as you observe, you know, where, 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 where some places that people might live would be. I, I think you have to enable the, the neighborhoods to evolve, but they need some catalysts. And so, you know, put some catalysts in there uh, and start watching and sprinkling. And, you know, do something about the tilt tops and yeah, maybe plant a few trees as, as I think uh, Sarah said. Great, thank you, Robert. Okay, John, Tila, then David, then George. Yeah, thanks. I, I have to say, I, uh, I agree with just about everything that's been said uh, so far in, in this response. I, I would just point out that it's important to remember that the housing here, which is desired and I think uh, needed in the city, that we need to remember that most people who wind up living here probably won't be working here. So it's tempting to think that just because there's jobs 
and housing located in a similar area, but the people who, who are living there will be working in that area. But in fact, that doesn't happen anywhere else in the city, and I don't think it'll be happening here either. That doesn't change the desirability of housing, but uh, we need to keep in mind that, that there will be people moving out to, to commute to their job elsewhere. Thanks. Great, thanks, John. Okay, Tila, David, George. Hey, it's not alphabetization, but uh, Hutch, I think Hutch captured a lot really, really well and succinctly. I also like what I've been hearing. Um, but the question is like, what are the qualities and characteristics that support a 15 minute neighborhood, right? So in short, what makes walking a preferred mode here? Um, and I am gonna say out loud, making driving more difficult will help do that. Um, but also I think it comes down to kind of three basic things. And one is, is maybe variety. And the second is a small scale. And the third is building to expect foot traffic. And so along those, I kind of mean for the variety, we talked about walkability, walkability, which often means like how long does it take you to get from A to B, but it doesn't generally encompass ideas of the desirability of walking for, for on your journey or getting to somewhere. And so I think a lot of the discussion about destination making is, is spot on. Uh, if people don't have a place to go and if it's uncomfortable and unpleasant before you get there, people will choose a different mode. Um, so the destination making is great. And to support that, I am totally here whining about the diversity of housing. I am really concerned um, about creating an affordable housing district. <laughs> um, I know that we've been having fights for years about infill and affordable, you know, picking spots for affordable housing to get sort of shoehorned into other developments. And there's always the question of, where does it go? You know, people in, in, in general want to support it. Um, and it seems like because no one lives out here now, that seems like it's going to be the easiest place, politically speaking, and as part of a community conversation to put it. But it doesn't feel like a neighborhood if it's all the same thing. So I completely um, support a, a diversity of, of incomes, of kinds of housing, and kinds of families that we're drawing there. And also a diversity of uses by times of day, times of week, times of year. We have very seasonal variations. And what people like to do outdoors and trying to create some flexibility in some of the spaces that are there would um, aid that variety. As far as small scale, I think we we all would like to see something smaller scale than we have to go to as these things change over time for the buildings to get smaller, the business footprints to get smaller, maybe more sharing of spaces um, and definitely the wastelands of parking and roadways that are um, out there now to, to become smaller and more human scaled and more flexible. Um, and one big point that hasn't really come up yet is um, we seem to be treating the natural, well, they're not natural, the barriers that have emerged to a low stress network, uh, 55th Street, Arapaho, we heard in public comment, it's impossible to turn left out of my neighborhood. That's a barrier to permeability and connectivity both into and out of and through the city's neighborhood. And all of these um, proposed areas, you know, they have, have been talked about, like this is a natural island here, the Foothills um, Office Park, because uh, it's hard to get across certain of these streets. Um, they're uncomfortable. 55th Street is hard to cross as a pedestrian, as someone on a bike. And so trying to uh, not assume um, that those barriers are there forever, that these are rivers of uncrossable motor vehicle traffic would, I think, benefit very well to make that more of a 15 minute walkable neighborhood and draw people sort of across different um, um, boundaries that they are not free to cross right now. So I really would caution us um, to, to giving away too much that's already been given away and try to reclaim some of it. So the way that the working group um, wanted, I think they wanted mixed use industrial to move closer to 55th Street near the, the Foothills office park. It's that kind of thinking like, let's not just have the mixed use housing on just this one side of Arapaho, but have a way that it straddles it and becomes more of a gateway and more uh, makes more sense for people to try to cross. Um, the third one is expecting foot traffic. So that means including things where there are signalized intersections, including LPIs, including buttons that pedestrians don't have to cross to ask uh, for permission to interrupt the flow of motor vehicle traffic, um, making bulb outs and physical separation, physically separated. Um, facilities, the default design in a lot of these places is how you get to a 15 minute neighborhood. You expect these things to be there. And that really points to, um, Ryan talked about um, the EV generation. So assuming that there will be electric vehicles of all kinds, assuming that we're going to see different kinds of micromobility um, vehicles and planning for a saturation of them 
is part of place making, it's part of planning for, um, for foot traffic, it's part of planning for people to be out of their cars and in some other device and connecting more viscerally and more directly with these neighborhoods. That's how you get the 15 minute paper. Thank you. All right, well, um, I'll, I'll just say, um, I guess it's my turn, right, Jean? Yep. <laughs> I'll say that uh, I've heard so many great things, so I'll try not to repeat too many of them. I would like to congratulate the working group uh, and uh, staff on uh, having gone out and taking the temperature of people's opinions on the three concepts. I see a lot of concept three in this proposal, uh, which was the most popular. Uh, and uh, I think that I want to point out that um, all, I, I really agree with everything that uh, Tila and others have said about uh, uh, really having a diversity of forms uh, the, and, and that's what attracts you out of the house uh, without getting in a car to move about the neighborhood and makes you feel joyful as you do it. Uh, I really want to uh, make Sarah happy by saying that housing diversity is really important. Uh, as we go into um, as we go into the zoning, that's where you can start to really kind of fine tune a lot of that stuff. So the zoning, I would hope, would uh, um, encourage uh, maybe additional density along the transit corridors, uh, would could it perhaps have, make use of limited, uh, limited use uh, and uh, uh, various um, kinds of incentives to do uh, diverse forms, and then maybe be able to specify percentages of what kinds of outcomes we'd like to see so that we make sure that we preserve a certain percentage of for, uh, for, uh, uh, for various types of uses. Uh, so that's gonna be important. And I just wanna go back to what uh, Lupita said on food, food, uh, a food area that would bring people together. I went to Wellington, New Zealand a couple of years ago and they have a soccer field that once a week they turn into a food gathering space for the community. And uh, they make sure that you get a reusable fork and napkin at the door and you go from, the, they have like a pavilion and food trucks and then a whole bunch of picnic tables and you just mix with people. So cool. So, <laughs> so we can figure out ways to be uh, flexible in use so that we have these periodic places for everybody to mingle. That's a really great idea, Lupita. Thank you for that. Great. Thank you, David. Were you done? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. And then um, we'll round out with George for this, this set. Um, so I, I agree with a lot of things that were said. So I'm going to I'm going to focus on the things that that I that I'd like to um, emphasize um, at the at the beginning when uh, Peter was talking about uh, the pedestrian and looking at this at a human scale. Um, I very much agree with that. I also agree with the idea of looking at that resident and understanding their entire life cycle at a particular neighborhood like this, um, meaning that that kind of dovetails into what Sarah and David were talking about diversity of housing and making sure that as that person progresses through their life cycle, they have opportunities to remain in their neighborhood. Um, so uh, I think that's important. I think it's also important to consider the things that are happening around this neighborhood. You know, we just saw a concept review from Ball uh, that showed us that they're gonna increase parking by 800 uh, or a thousand parking spaces and it seems um, disconnected from what we're talking here. Um, similarly, you know, when we look at Waterview and you look at all the ELUs that are in there, that really seems to service just one sliver of uh, a neighborhood. Um, and so I would, I, would, I, would, I would really look to look across the, entire, the entirety of, a, of, of someone's life to really understand how they would fit into a neighborhood long term. Um, I like the idea of trees and greenery. And finally, when we were talking about um, dovetailing conversation the city's having now around community benefit, you know, the opportunity for placemaking here, um, the opportunity for the arts and innovation, this could be an area of opportunity where we could use the commercial community benefit. And rather than trying to place little slivers of real estate into new developments across the city, try to focus in on a, on a community gathering place where we could actually establish a fund through the city and use it uh, as, a, as a way to, to leverage um, something new and unique to, as a draw for this area. So that's it. Great, thanks, George. Okay, wow, you guys, um, you guys are awesome. 
um, so many great ideas very quickly um, and building off of each other and a lot of key, a lot of key items that um, resonate through all of your um, comments on those. Um, a lot of your comments, you, you touched on the, the mobility improvements or some of the transportation things. So just in the interest of time, I think we were scheduled to eight, but I think we're going to need to, uh, if you all are um, willing to stay on for a little longer, let's go through the second question um, in the reverse order. Um, and then and then we'll um, touch base with Kathleen and Jean and see like where are some of those comments coalescing and where do we need to talk a little bit more. So. Um, that, so to the second question around mobility improvements to help this area evolve, if you have more to add that, that you didn't add in the first round, um, let's go ahead and jump on those. So we'll, we'll go in reverse. So George and then um, uh, Tila and then David. I have, I have one. I'll let the transportation experts take it from there. I, I agree completely with the permeability. And um, when we go back to the, to the public comments that were stated here. Um, making sure that these sites are accessible and we address traffic on Arapaho um, and, and, and how, how that gets done, I, I think it's very complex, but, but, but you know, things like Ball and the Medical Center, et cetera, I think really need to be looked at as this and, and mobility around those areas as well. Great. Thanks, George. Okay, Tila, then David, then um, Hutch. Okay, so I did cover a fair bit um, in my first go, um, but as far as mobility improvements, I think there's only been a brief mention so far of really stressing PDM strategies, um, and especially for some of the larger employers, uh, we need to help them be more um, creative in thinking about different approaches other than just letting all of the employees do what they need to do. So really supporting things like private van pools, subsidizing, um, more aggressively, um, different PDM strategies. This would be a great place to try new things out that we haven't necessarily tried in, in other parts of the city. Um, I already spoke about trying to saturate the area with micro mobility options and, um, and supporting infrastructure. And by that, I, I definitely mean making our roadways look different in this part of town. Um, it's often hard to retrofit things that we wish we had done better. Um, to support and protect more vulnerable road users. And this is a great place to make the roads look different from the get-go, especially if we're going to try to be um, encouraging micromobility devices, places like office parks where office workers might have driven there uh, at the beginning and end of their day, but discouraging midday trips by using smaller, lighter, more you know, available shared vehicles. This would be a really good place to, to do that while you know, maintaining support for the business needs as the question asks. Uh, and finally, a, a less dedication of space for just single uses. There's far too much, you know, parking or not parking without thinking about can it be time of day loading zones? Can it be, um, you know, just more flexible um, uses that change as uh, the needs change in the, during the time of day, during the day of the week, uh, even during season, seasonal changes, we, we might discover that people are less, less needing parking in the uh, spring and fall. Um, months when it's nicer biking weather that are discouraged from doing so during the winter and summer. That's not ideal, but it's better than driving every day. So trying to be more flexible about how people arrive and get there and support that. Great. Thanks, Tila. Okay, David, then Hutch, then John, and then Mark. Yeah, we, uh, I won't add a whole lot, but I'll, I'll say that we, um, when we do uh, in, on planning boards see uh, developments occur along transportation corridors that have a master plan. We really try to make sure that every last little bit of that happens, but oftentimes we end up then, then with kind of piecemeal. You go along really, breezing along really nicely, uh, either walking or biking, and so, uh, along a block that has been developed, and then you reach a point that hasn't uh, uh, achieved the master plan yet. So, uh, so I love it when we, when we can move things along uh, an entire corridor uh, so that we actually have those wonderful uh, uh, bike and pedestrian connections. Uh, and um, as e-bikes become more popular, the more breathing space you have for the bikes and pedestrians so that you uh, have uh, realized that the e-bikes are gonna be coming along uh, potentially a little faster than the pedal bikes. Uh, and, uh, but they are really great ways to get around uh, uh, in an eco-friendly way. Uh, that's great. So, and I meant, um, actually just in our concept review the other day, we saw, a a potential routing of a bike path along that master plan along the railroad that showed it kind of wandering about. So I'll just put in another plug for 
trying to see if we can have more direct and not so such wandering bike paths. Uh, and that's uh, sometimes, again, when you do things piecemeal, you end up with these little twists and turns that, you know, the first time you do them, they're fun, but after a while, you're really trying to get somewhere. So let's try to get the, make those bike paths really uh, uh, usable to the user. Uh, I guess I'll pass on. Okay, great. Thanks, David. Okay, Hutch, did you have anything else to add? Uh, sure. I, I think there's there are several things. One is, this is an obvious place to do, you know, state-of-the-art large employer programs. And there, there's certainly some approaches out there, as, as Tila mentioned. I suspect there's also the opportunity to do small employer programs because it's such a geographically focused area. You can literally, you know, fly or drop to every building and, and that sort of stuff pretty easily. Um, I, I, so, so that part of it, uh, and particularly around getting that high degree of engagement about the flow of folks in and out, figure, figure out if there's stuff around hours. You know, the perception from the outside is there's a workday evening and a weekend set of categories where the dynamics of this will be quite different. And perhaps, uh, perhaps that, that can be evolved in, into something very important. And the important thing I, I think is this would be a fabulous part of town to really, really experiment with and push both micro mobility and potentially uh, some of the shared uh, vehicular mobility stuff uh, around EV charging. Uh, I've looked at some of the maps of the power lines and where the high voltage is and stuff like that. And this is a part of town where we, actually, we can actually do charging without necessarily paying huge amounts for additional infrastructure. So I'd recommend uh, taking a, a bit better look at that uh, and saying, you know, do we have some charging dynamics whether it involves full-size cars or even uh, trucks, uh, truck fleets and stuff like that or not, uh, there's shared micro mobility charging infrastructure coming out now from providers. You can, you know, cruise up to them in any small wheel vehicle and plug them in, whether it's a wheelchair or a scooter or a bicycle or what have you. Um, and this this would be a place where, with proper engagement strategies. Uh, you could really push those things. Uh, they could potentially uh, have weekend and evening dynamics as well as work day dynamics. So, so for me, there, there's a, a lot in the art of the possible out there because it's sort of recreation land on weekends right now anyway, at least for the folks that get on their bikes and go for a long way. Okay. Um Thanks, Hutch. Okay, then um, let's see, we have John, then Mark, then Lopita, and then Ryan. Okay, well, uh, every everything mentioned here makes a lot of sense to me, and I, I won't repeat it, but I do support it. But there's one other point I, I would like to emphasize, and that is uh, we discussed, there was a brief mention earlier about the uh, OSO land, and uh, I think uh, we shouldn't forget the potential use of OSO in this area, which sometimes is along irrigation canals and so on. The potential value of that for bike paths and, and transit corridors of various types that are compatible with OSO characterization. So I just wanted to throw that in the mix to make sure we don't uh, lose those uh, possibilities. <laughs> Thanks, John. Okay, Mark, then Lupita, then Ryan, then Sarah. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, John, I completely support using canals, old rails, I, I, everything, every possible feature for additional uh, dedicated cycling facilities. I, I'm in wholehearted support of that. So my uh, addition to this, and I just put a link into the chat, and I hope that's okay. Uh, to um, a podcast regarding roundabouts. This is an area, as we, as we change the character of this area and we deal with to the transportation needs of this area, uh, we have to think beyond uh, signalized intersections and look at the rest of the world, especially Europe, where roundabouts are, are a, a standard feature and, and they're completely compatible with industrial areas 
and they're completely compatible with cycling and pedestrians if designed properly. Uh, and no one should use the, the traffic circles on spruce and pine as an example of anything other than bad design. But anyway, I think this area is ripe for an expansion of micromobility like Tila talked about and, and Hutch talked about and changes. But I, I think roundabouts are something that, that we need to really think about and incorporate into this area to um, make it safer, to achieve our vision zero goals and to uh, make, it, make it more livable all the way around. Great, thank you. Okay, Lupita, Ryan, then Sarah. Thank you. So I just wanted, I wanted to add um, that roundabouts are also very popular in Latin America. So I think that it's probably popular just about everywhere. Uh, and I think it's a really good idea. Um, I wanted to mention in terms of uh, the transportation uh, thing, I thought that um, I, I made some comments to Ball who presented to the board just recently. And that was uh, having uh, grown up sort of in Southern California, and, and work in the area where it was most congested in the in the LA district by the LAX with all the um, aerospace industry was at the time when I was young. Um, they had scheduling uh, staggered um, starting and ending day uh, uh, working hours. So if if we are dealing with a lot of traffic, I, I would like this to be part of the the repertoire that we have for the city to deal with congestion, especially when we're talking about industrial areas when we have a lot of companies bringing their in um, the workers. So that's one thing in terms of just scheduling. Another thing is in terms of uh, providing spaces for people to leave their car. So parking rights should be something that the city thinks regularly about where they can be placed strategically so that even for those of us who live on the city, I might be coming from Denver or somewhere else and I don't wanna have to go all the way to my house to leave my car so I can go and like I said, you know, maybe, maybe go and have a nice evening by the creek uh, where I know there's going to be an event tonight and I wanna do this walking, I just need to leave my car somewhere and the same thing for anybody come from outside. So I think that parking rights should be kind of like part of our parts and, and um, just our way of thinking. Uh, let me see, so staggering work. Um, oh, another thing that has to do with uh, areas where we want to promote people uh, to mo uh, mobility, um, there are places like the Sistine uh, Street Mall in Denver where you know you can just be walking and hop on the little shuttle that they have. Many cities have this sort of thing. It's very, very reduced. So this is something that I would like oh, in terms of mobility, I think to consider potentially something that is just going up and down some of these arteries or a very reduced area just for this particular uh, section. If, if in, in fact, it, it, it turns out to be uh, something that we revitalize to the point that we really want to uh, for, encourage it further. That's it. Great, thanks Lupita. Okay, Ryan, Sarah, then Alex. I think I answered this question in part previously, so I'll just maybe say one more one more word here or two. Uh, I, I agree, I think with everything I've heard, especially Tila and Mark and Lupita, and, and Mark and Lupita talking about looking to Europe and Latin America for inspiration, I think it's a great idea. And with Tila that, um, you know, I would just add a few points on um, what she said is that, you know, we really have this chance, I think, to flip the script um, from widening highways only to increase demand for vehicles to, to widening uh, streets for micromobility only to increase demand for micromobility. And maybe two, two points to think about within that. One is, um, you know, the, the, the way we're going to make micromobility in all its forms are the, the safest is by creating the greatest number of the most vehicles, the, the greatest number of people using them, and, and, to, and to start from the outset with a pretty, a pretty big system to do that. And the second is when we talk about or think about micromobility, there's, of course, the shared scooters we know about today and the e-bikes we know today that a lot of us are familiar with, but th there's so many emerging form factors that are going to create wider vehicles in which you can have three and four wheel uh, e-bike deliveries. You can move kids around to, to school on them um, that that may not just, you know, fit on the types of um, roadway bikeways we use today. So just to really think about where is this all going with these advances in um, batteries and the ability to have um, light electric vehicles. Um, and then I'll just close by saying I, there was some example about 
how California or the Bay Area got it wrong. And, you know, I think there is another uh, instructive tragedy and it's, and I'm, you know, come recently from the Bay Area and from Oakland. And it's, if you, you wait until development happens, you know, you can't, you can't remove nine parking spaces for a critical bikeway, let alone to get dedicated bus lanes or extend the BART. So um, th this is the time. Great, thank you. Okay, Sarah, Next. Alex, yep. Lisa, then Peter. So I'm gonna oh, go coming. to the source of the traffic problem, which is a five to one job, uh, jobs housing imbalance. <laughs> the proposals for um, all three proposals uh, are 30,000 jobs uh, or more. And I think the maximum housing dwelling units is 7,000. And it's just gonna exacerbate our existing jobs housing imbalance. And I, <clears throat> I just think that we need to bear that in mind going forward. Um, and uh, no matter how many wonderful micromobility uh, tools exist, if you have 26,000 people in commuting every day, <clears throat> adds a lot of additional traffic of all, time, of all types. And this is a core issue for the city. I'm not suggesting to not have jobs, but we have to take this into account when we're doing this kind of planning. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, Alex, then Lisa. I'd just like to add on to something Tila said earlier about the arterial streets. For this area to be really walkable, it's gonna to need to be possible to get from uh, destinations to destination. And in a lot of cases, there's gonna be an arterial in the way. And while arterials only make up a small percentage of our streets, it's where the majority of our severe crashes happen. And so I'd like for us to think of streets like East Arapaho 55th and especially that short segment of Valmont as our primary uh, infrastructure improvement needs. And then things like off street uh, multi-use paths or especially underpasses as more secondary or tertiary uh, project needs. Great, thanks Alex. Okay, Lisa, and then we'll, finish, we'll round out with Peter. Um, yeah, so um, I don't wanna repeat anything anyone has already said, but I think one thing that I would love to see the city find a way um, to be really active in, uh, and perhaps this is a bridge too far, but is either a parking district or something like a parking district. Um, you know, so I think back to the sump principles, shared, un, uh, unbundled, managed, paid. Um, you know, I think about the expense of putting up parking garages versus doing parking lots, and the fact that um, you know folks developing out there are not going to be incentivized to put up parking garages unless we require it. Um, and even if they are building parking garages, or even if we're providing parking garages as the city or in a public private partnership, um, that we really wanna be building those in such a way um, that are meeting current best practices so that those can be re reused, you know, so that when we have more autonomous vehicles, when we continue to see a shift to telework, um, you know, that we're not just stuck with these very expensive parking garages um, that need to be torn down to be used for something else. So, um, it's a, it's a big region, you know, I'm not sure that a single overlay parking district is uh, tenable or desirable necessarily as much as I might like the idea of it. Um, but I think the city should be thinking about how do we do that, you know, are, are, are we building, you know, some degree of parking garages, are we incentivizing that, how are we disincentivizing these surface lots and um, providing ways for people to do that that work in concert uh, with the pedestrian environment with the TDM um, with the bike paths. Um, with the bus service um, so that we don't, you know, have these, frankly, these parking lots that are going to need to be redeveloped in another 10, 15, 20 years. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, Peter, any uh, last comments that you want to share um, regarding that last question? That hadn't sure, I think this may be relevant here. I'll, I'll let go everything, uh, but the idea of the smaller capacity electric shuttles less than the sizes than the old buses trundling along. And so, you know, eight to 16 person electric uh, shuttles that could, um, you know, be equipped with bolt on aftermarket uh, driver assist. I can say take the driver out, make them fully autonomous. I think we're a long way from that, but all the different safety features that come along with that. And this of course is, you know, on top of all of the other uh, pedestrian and cycling solutions that were offered here. Wow. 
There's a lot there. Um, I've, I've seen Jean and Kathleen take notes on mural. And so I'm, I'm, I know that we'll be amazed at all, everything that they were able to capture. Um, a lot, so many comments around, um, I think that resonated with each other around that mix of uses and the importance of the, of really the importance of the street and the, and the mobility parts that help people get around to support both the diversity of uses, diversity of housing, and to create some important destinations um, in East Boulder. And then around mobility improvements, really hearing a lot about creativity and um, some improvements that, you know, now is the time. Um, thinking about the evolution of the area and how that will continue um, with new technology and new programs and shared uses and other types of things. So with that, Kathleen and Jean um, and everybody, I think we were scheduled till eight and we were over that. Um, I'd like to just check in about both time and um, clarifying items or clarifying questions or digging a little deeper that you guys would like to do based on what you've heard that will really help um, further this these recommendations. Well, um, I'm, I, I don't know. I could uh, say that um, I, I'm good for 15 more minutes. I don't know how. If we wanted to try to keep it to some limited amount, I don't know how other people feel. I'm good too. Sounds like um, perhaps we we could um, have any other additional comments till about eight thirty. Kathleen, would that work? For you? Yeah, I've got a, a couple uh, quick ish, maybe follow ups. <laughs> so uh, that'd be great. People can hang around. That'd be good. Okay, thanks. You All want right. to on people, Jean, or would you like me to? Um, David, if you can, I'm, the, I am, my sound is going in and out. So if you okay. could handle this part, that would be awesome. Um, I can see all the hands because I've got a huge giant HDTV screen. <laughs> do you want to go first and then Lupita? And then I'm going to call on myself, I think. Kathleen, did you have something you wanted to clarify? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm just going to show you uh, what I had going on in the background here. Um, so um, Jean and I yeah, have been um, taking notes throughout the conversation and I was focused on the top one. And then um, while you were um, answering the second question, I, I started to try to group some of them. So some of you know my big takeaways from the conversation around this first question is there's great support and interest in, in getting to a place where redevelopment in this area um, emphasizes and really demonstrates great human scale design. Um, a lot of conversation about diversity, both in kind of form, um, but also in function, in um, people, in places. Um, so a lot of great input on that topic. Um, um, some great ideas about creating destinations, making destinations, and, and part of that conversation was around some programming and, and some potential catalysts that um, the city could, could kind of instigate. Um, it sounds like there was more conversation around this topic in, in the second question, but just the idea of reconsidering parking um, and, and figuring out some ways in, in this area to um, potentially better use or reconfigure or um, look at parking differently in East Boulder. Um, interest in experimentation and, and, you know, kind of piloting some things and trying new things out here. So that's really exciting to me. Um, certainly urban canopy, which is um, definitely on the radar. Um, some ideas about visual leg legibility, and then also, um, you know, the idea of people are, are coming in, we know, but as we build in residential, we have to consider out commuters and, and what their experience would be also. So the one kind of um, big question that I would like to, to get some more input on is around this um, human scale design. You know, I, I think somebody said we really want um, small scale, smaller spaces. And um, 
one of the things that we've learned during this process is that um, industrial businesses have large building, large space needs. And um, the industrial buildings and industrial spaces that, in, that are in East Boulder today are really aging. And so those businesses are leaving for Gun Barrel or for other cities to find that kind of large space that they need. And so, you know, when we're looking at that map and kind of the, the areas of change and areas of no change, um, I think, you know, my question is, do we want to um, consider those large space industrial needs and locate them in, in some of the areas that, um, that are mapped for kind of that general industrial category or are mapped for um, no changes as part of this process and then really focus some of this smaller scale redevelopment in the areas of change or you know our larger spaces larger buildings to suit these different types of industries um okay in those areas of change i'm not sure i i fully described that but i'm hoping that that you have some thoughts on it um because i think that's a, a topic i could use some more direction on um Let's see, do we want to go with Lupita first and then Sarah? Yeah, because I think Lupita, you had your hand up before, but I don't know if it was on this particular subject. <laughs> well, actually, I, I was going to make a comment about uh, just appreciating and wanting to make sure that everybody heard my, um, that I really appreciate this process because I think that being in the planning board is very few times that I feel that we're actually planning. I think most of our work is about <laughs> responding. So it is not planning that goes on when you just welcome whatever comes in. So I I even had a joke about it said maybe we should be the welcoming committee as opposed <laughs> to the planning board. But anyways, this is just side comment on it. But this this is truly planning. So I really appreciate this process. And re with regards to the what Kathleen just brought up is uh, with regard, I was gonna ask in terms of if you know whether there is, um, Aid um, salary differences between, uh, you know, what this type of uh, higher, uh, more industrial, bigger buildings versus the small office building uh, that we seem to be promoting more. Is mm -hmm. there anything in terms of salary differences and in, in the terms of industries that these two will target? Because maybe that will be one way that we can pay attention. You know, what do we want to promote and I will say um, we should promote something that is on the lower scale as opposed to the higher scale. Sarah, did you want to give your feedback on that? Uh, yeah, so I think Lupita's point is very important. And, and it seems like there's some other data that we might want to understand, including what are the actual manufacturing, light industrial manufacturing facilities in town? Um, uh, and uh, where are they located uh, and could they be, and what are the trends in terms of where manufacturing might be going in general um, before we can even begin to answer your question? Because essentially your question is, do we ultimately sacrifice manufacturing jobs for a different kind of industrial space? And I don't think we have that kind of information in front of us to even begin to discuss it. Um, uh, we certainly don't want to undermine the economic base of Boulder or the jobs opportunities in Boulder. Uh, and this has always been one of the issues with putting residential in industrial zones, which is that it increases the value of the land and therefore makes it more, more valuable to the landowner to transfer transform it into something other than industrial zoning. And um, it's why we have, I think it's 2.17 in the Boulder Valley Comp Plan. And I think it's a very important question that you've touched on. And my guess is we won't have an answer until we have some more, we won't even be able to discuss it until we have more data. Great. And I think I was gonna go ahead and call on myself next. And any other hands uh, I can 
my mark you can go next um so uh yes um i wanted to uh say that i totally agree with the last two comments i think it's sort of sort of um up to i think it's useful to make the uh the zoning flexible enough that we can take out opportunities to potentially have something large even in these spaces when it would make sense to and so um there, you know, there may be some new creative zoning districts, uh, again, with it, that have some kind of a little bit more um, creativity built into how that, how the uh, pros around each uh, outcome can uh, be done. And so, uh, yeah, it is hard at this point to say a yes or no on that question, but I wouldn't want to necessarily preclude. And I also wanted to just touch on what you brought up a couple times, Sarah, and that is the, um, the jobs potential in this uh, is already at uh, that 35,000, uh, 35,000 is the current job potential. And that job potential actually goes down slightly in each of the concepts. So yes, um, th that is, there is that potential, but just because it, the potential is there doesn't mean it's gonna get built out to that level. Uh, I do agree though, that um, when you do put housing in, it probably could create some pressure to build out to that level, but it does give me some reassurance to know that if uh, from the Boulder Valley comp plan uh, aspiration, import, very important uh, part of the comp plan is uh, to look at the jobs housing imbalance that we are at least increasing housing potential and not increasing uh, jobs potential. So just wanted to throw that in there. Um, Anyone else? Uh, uh, Mark, you were next. I, I know it's not a focal point of our discussion tonight, but I, I do want to point out that in the memo, uh, the art, culture, arts, and placemaking are a um, are kind of a co-equal feature of, of the planning process. And I also noticed that the Valmont power plant, the plant itself, falls within the city limits. And I could find no real further discussion of the power plant. And I just did a quick little survey of power plants as converted to art centers. And maybe you on planning board have been talking about this for years and I'm just in the dark. But anyway, I, I really think that, that that could be an Eastern anchor and e an Eastern entryway into the city and it could be a, another thing that makes Boulder special, like our downtown mall, like NCAR, like our open space. And I just did a quick little survey, you know, uh, Dallas, London, uh, Essen, Germany, Ontario, Toronto, Shanghai, Berlin, Helsinki, Moscow, all have uh, power plants converted to art centers, specifically art centers. So anyway, I think we have this, uh, real resource out there. I know we don't, we don't own it, just like we don't own a lot of things, but um, we are at a particular uh, point in relationship with Excel. And I think, I think it's certainly worth uh, evaluating and discussing. Great. Thanks, Mark. I'll, I'll just point out that um, there, isn't there a Be Heard Boulder uh, survey on the power plant out there right now that you can go answer? I think I think I went and started answering it yesterday, and it was too long, and have to go back to it. <laughs> <laughs> so now's your chance, Mark, to go crazy on Be Heard Boulder. I don't I don't think we are. That one's actually on Be Heard Boulder. We're working with a um, couple of students uh, on a capstone, oh, and yeah. um, we can send that link out to everybody because I'm sure that they would love to get your all's feedback. So I that was it. And in fact, I think it came from you. Thank you, Jane. Yep. That's right. Okay. Um, oh, so we've got just a few minutes left. Jean, did you want to, or do, Kathleen, Jean, do, do we want to just do a quick show of some of the themes that we captured for the mobility questions? And is there, and then I think um, we'll probably just want to do a, a quick wrap up and, and a huge thank you for thank taking you the time. We have time for a couple more questions because I see two more hands up but, um, or comments. Uh, do people mind if uh, John and Lisa go? Because I think I saw them excited to say a couple things. And then, then we'll do that. John? Uh, I'm muted. muted. Okay. Uh, just, just quickly, I, I mentioned earlier that the Boulder Airport is part of this planning area, but we have not addressed it yet. <laughs> And I know that it's not something that TAB typically gets involved with, but 
nevertheless, the air air transport is a function of of transport in Boulder. And so this is a chance for you guys to say what you think uh, might uh, be appropriate for the future of the airport, whether it should stay as is or whether there might be changes there that we should be considering. So to the degree you have thoughts on that, I think it would be welcome. I ask, I think Natalie Stifler is on the call and Natalie and I talked about the airport, but my understanding from that conversation, um, Natalie, you can pop on and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the airport operations are predominantly, if not exclusively, leisure operations. It's just for uh, the gliders that you see around. And we're not really receiving transport like freight at the airport. Is that right? If I, if I get it wrong, Natalie can hop on and tell me. But um, it's always been a little odd that the, the airport falls under the jurisdiction of the transportation staff because uh, it might more appropriately fit with community vitality if it's, you know, just for recreational purposes. So that's my basic understanding of what the airport operations are today. I can talk just a, a little bit about the airport, which is that um, as part of this process, we haven't looked at changing land uses at the airport. Um, we have financial commitments um, to maintain it as a um, place for air travel and uh, aeronautics related businesses uh, well into the future. But um, we have had some great conversations with the airport manager talking about um, um, business space and thinking about, you know, affordable um, in light industrial space, affordable um, business space, and how, um, you know, we can only control the affordability of space that we own, and we own the airport. And so thinking about some um, creative ways to use some of the hangar spaces and, and other things to um, provide kind of startup space um, aeronautics related business space for, for um, those types of, of smaller business owners um, is a conversation that we're having. And then um, the, other, the other idea that I think is on the table is taking a look at um, the airport terminal and looking for ways to better integrate the terminal space with um, some of the surrounding community and make it more of a community space. So, you know, right now they host a lot of programs for kids and do partnerships with CU to um, use their community rooms and things like that. But it's just kind of a um, thing a lot of people don't know about unless you're involved in it. And so making that more an active community asset is, is something that we've talked about. Yeah, did you want to follow up, John? I know. Yeah, just to follow up, I, you know, the nature of the commitments we have with the FAA to keep it operating is for the next 20 years or something. But we're talking about a longer period than that for our, our sub area plans here. So we should be thinking about what happens after our commitments to FAA end, uh, because that's a very significant piece of land that we should be thinking consciously about. So that I, I don't think we solve it tonight. I just wanted to bring it to TAB's attention. If I could jump in real quick. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, our commitments to um, FAA and the federal government don't end after 20 years, unfortunately. And so if we were ever to try and rezone the property to do something different, um, we would, uh, we, the, you know, collectively the city and the taxpayers would be on the hook for quite a lot of um, repayment of, um, you know, for that resource, et cetera, that are in the many, many, many millions of dollars. And so that there's a cost benefit aspect to it, but we can certainly, um, you know, it's not an easy thing, but we can certainly explore that further. Okay, and I, um, great, thank you so much, Eric. I, I wanna recognize that um, Lisa, or John and Lisa had their hands up when Jean was gonna try to conclude it. And then we have now, uh, Ryan and Peter as well. Are people okay going on? Because we can, and since I'm doing the calling on, I just want to make sure. Thumbs up. Okay, Lisa. Um, yeah, so just off of um, the airport comment, I think that's a good point about um, the size of the space and, and not locking ourselves into a, a certain use. But um, I would also say from an emergency operations perspective, um, especially as climate change continues to get worse, 
um, that losing that airspace, not being able to shut it down and run tankers out of there and like smaller helicopters and things, most of them will be coming out of old Jeffco, which is what now Rocky Mountain. Um, but but there, there are advantages from an emergency operations perspective to having that site um, that close to the foothills and um, that close to our urban, to our WUI, our wild uh, land urban interface. Um, and then um, I also wanted to just, um, what was our, oh, uh, power plant. So um, love the idea of redeveloping the power plant, especially as we continue uh, to retire, hopefully, eventually the gas fire part, parts of it. Um, something that I've talked about in planning board before that I'm sure the CU students are keeping in mind and I'm sure our attorneys are highly aware of um, is just that that is basically a super fun site. Um, so I would just encourage um, the city uh, and council and so on to be very, very thoughtful about when we put ourselves on title um, and when we assume liability for cleaning up that site and which portions of the parcel um, we take title to, even if we at some point wanted to, because as soon as you're on the title, you're on the hook for cleaning it. So um, just wanted to put that out there, which isn't a reason not to redevelop it or do something super cool. Tate Modern's awesome. There's really cool things that happen with power plants, um, but we just want to be a little defensive about what we expose ourselves to. Thank you, Lisa. Brian and then Peter. Just real fast, wanted to encourage staff, if you hadn't thought about it, um, the, the electrification of airplanes and that this is actually, this is happening. San Joaquin Valley in, in California has got a number of these. They're very small craft. They're using those trainer pilot, trainer, trainer vehicles. The Peeps, Peepstrel, I think is one of the, one of the, 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 the models. If you Google it, you'll see um, it, you know, there's a whole sort of interesting thing you can do with, with these at smaller airports. So I don't know what levers or, you know, regulations or whatever you might have, but there, there could be an economic growth, sort of an opportunity, make, make it sort of interesting. So um, I'd be happy to make introductions to some of the folks in my space that's working on that, if you like, um, but it seems like worth exploring. Cool. And then Peter, I haven't seen- Same point, the micromobility options for vertical takeoff and landing, electric aviation and short hops from DIA to Boulder, which will take cars off the road and carbon out of the air and actually be really important. And so I want to throw that in there. Excellent. Cool. All right, Jean. Thank you, everybody, for these additional comments. Thanks so much. Um, Jean, Kathleen, do we want to just circle back and, um, and show any notes or key themes from the uh, Part B question? Yeah, Jean, I can um, share my screen with the mural, and um, maybe you can talk through the, some of the themes that you heard. Let's see, here we go. And Jean Sanson, you're on mute. I'm not, I'm not seeing her. So maybe I will, <laughs> I'll just highlight uh, the groupings that she made. Um, so, uh, pet and bike access, um, and, um, kind of the value of that and how that's adding to the area, um, ideas about TDM strategies and, and thinking about, um, some of the, um, changing dynamics of parking that we touched on in the above question, um, ideas about micro mobility and new technology, the ideas of, um, East Boulder being able to be sort of a testing ground for some of this stuff. Um, thoughts on roadway design. We heard about um, roundabouts, um, um, protecting vulnerable users. Um, um, I think we've had a, a lot of a lot of good input uh, around parking. Um, and then let's see um, land use and transportation. How those two pieces are kind of coming together. It looks like, and how you know one affects the other, and we have to really think about some of the urban design character that comes into play. And then it looks like she's been taking some notes on the airport as well. And it looks like you're unmuted, Jean. So if I missed anything, go ahead. No, you got it. Sorry about that. I had um, technical difficulties unmuting myself. Um, yeah. So you you nailed it, Kathleen. You know what's really exciting to me is just the theme of 
East Boulder being ripe for testing and change and thinking about yeah. how mobility is changing, particularly micro mobility, um, you know, uh, you know, electric vehicle deliveries and, 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 and um, such. So, and thinking about how that affects how we use our space, particularly our public infrastructure space in that area. So thank you, really appreciate um, the very thoughtful um, and innovative comments. Really, really great discussion um, and so much that we'll be able to take forward. Um, Kathleen, do you want to just reiterate next steps and then we think we can call it a night? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much to everybody for um, coming tonight. This was super helpful and I'm glad we got to have these two groups interact and work together. Um, I think, you know, we got a lot of great direction. Um, we're we're going to be going to a city council study session next week with a similar presentation, but I'll incorporate um, all of your feedback from tonight. Um, and then we go go back to the, the kind of drawing board with our working group and um, city staff, and we'll start to refine some of those areas and um, take a, a deeper dive into um, the, the um, what we call the, the programs, policies, and projects to make all of this stuff kind of happen. Um, and then, you know, we're hoping to get to a, a draft plan for everyone to weigh in on and review this summer. So we're, we're thinking um, about a goal of a 60% draft um, sometime this summer. And that's probably when we'll have our um, next check-in with these groups and, and um, we'll keep cycling, we'll keep going through it. Great. Well, very good. Thank you, everybody. Um, have a great night, and thank you so much um, for the discussion. We'll 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 see you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Dean, we'll see ya. <laughs> Thanks, Holly.